Blackstone Audio presents Day of Wrath by William R. Forstgen. Chapter 1 725 AM near Portland, Maine. We have lived with the abnormal for so long. We believe it to be normal. Bob Peterson gazed at the screen for a moment, not sure if he should continue. He had long ago come to the conclusion that blogging and posting commentary on Facebook was a supreme act of self-indulgence. A few friends might read it, act polite, and give a thumbs up. There had been a time, before he made the wiser career choice of going into IT education versus creative writing, that he fancied he might make it as an author. After all, he lived in Maine, home to a lot of writers, and had even attended a few writers' workshops. The workshops were finally enough to convince him to pursue a more stable line of work, especially after he met Kathy, married, and started to think about a family. Facebook, for him, was not a place to vent. But today, this morning, the news of the day, echoing from the kitchen where Kathy was preparing lunches for their daughter Wendy and him to take to school, was yet another overwhelming litany of bad news, and it triggered a sense of foreboding. The offensive by ISIS in Iraq was on the march again. More images of mass executions, beheadings, and Christians being crucified. These were the horrors committed under the guidance of the one who had declared himself to be the returner of the caliphate, a man who, to Bob, was every bit as threatening as a Hitler or bin Laden. Bob's younger brother had died over there back in 2004. For what, in light of this latest news? Reports echoed from the television in the kitchen about the border along Texas. Not all trying to cross were refugees from impoverished Central America. New indications were that it was a route Middle Eastern terrorists were using to infiltrate. But for what? A commentator on his preferred news network just last night stated that he felt the perfect storm was about to explode. It had been a somewhat sleepless night. Kathy always told him he worried too much about what he could not fix, but this morning he was up an hour earlier than usual to just jot down some thoughts. It was as if some inner voice whispered that he had to make a statement now, to do it this morning before he left for work. Later in the day he would look back at it, and hopefully today would be an ordinary day like all the others across the years, and he'd be slightly embarrassed that he had posted these ramblings. We expect to be lied to, he continued to write. In fact, the truth is so rare these days that we think it is spoken only as a maneuver of the moment to cover yet another lie. Our leaders tell us to believe in them, that they do all for our good. They tell us that they fight for our rights while they travel about in entourages costing millions for their monthly vacations. They tell us to conserve, for all is running short, while their private jets take them to their next gathering. What are proclaimed to be our entertainers are experts on all things simply because they act a role in a movie. Their role model to our youth is one of dissipation, mocking any of us who try to teach our children any type of values. News last night was of yet another $30,000-a-plate fundraiser to pay for yet more lies to blanket their hypocrisy, to opiate us while the worshipful media stands awestruck. Every night is Oscar night in Washington with some self-congratulatory award. Every day a new scandal of the day, at least for that 24-hour news cycle, is examined with about as much critical skill as that of entertainment reporters gasping about who left her husband for a new affair. Politics are merged with entertainment, and entertainment with politics, though one used to be only for diversion while the other truly was, and still is, a matter of life and death. The death of a second-rate actor to drugs draws more media and mourning than the sealed metal boxes returning from the Middle East. He paused after writing that line. The morning that he and Kathy were preparing to head to Dover Air Force Base to greet the returning casket of his brother, the headline news was about the accidental death of yet another entertainer to a drug overdose. Several days later, the media lavished attention on tearful fans weeping at the funeral. His brother and four others of his squad were buried that day, and had hardly made local news. The only ones who wept at his brother's funeral were his family, friends from high school, and a comrade who had been assigned to escort the body, or what was left of the body they never opened the casket, home from Iraq. He sat in silent reflection for a moment, then continued to write. 
The new daily scandal of Washington has become business as usual, to be forgotten a day later with a new scandal, a new affair. The reality show has become reality and the real world an increasingly anesthetized dream to be ignored. And those of us who dare to question do so with voices lowered, for in America today, the worst sin of all, the real sin, is no longer racism or hatred. It is simply fear that you might offend. The Republic was not founded by those who feared to offend. It was not created by those who were afraid to fight back. Is it time to fight back? But how do we fight back? What do we fight back against? How do we fight back? Hey, Bob, you're going to be late. He looked at the screen, scrolled back over what he just wrote, highlighting it, and poised his finger over the delete button. Why bother? I'm just pissed off this morning. Vent here and I get 80 comments back, most of them inane, asking what the hell is bugging me. It will disappear while everyone prefers to see the latest video clip of who twerked her ass last night at some award ceremony or had a dress malfunction, and after all, we are being told that all the scandals are phony anyhow. Come on! He stood up, looked again at the screen, and let his finger drift from delete to enter. He hit the enter button, posting his musings, and felt a twinge of regret and embarrassment. Which friends would be offended today? Kathy was waiting out in the kitchen, making the loving gesture of holding out a cup of coffee. She was wearing what he called her frumpy bathrobe, her hair still something of a tangle and no makeup, all factors which made her even more lovable to him. Given their surprise a year ago, she had resumed the role of staying at home for a few more years. He gladly took the cup and drained it halfway in two gulps. She had mixed it nearly half and half coffee and cream, even though she was on his case about the cholesterol in the cream. She had taken on the ritual of getting up an hour earlier than he to cook breakfast for their older daughter and make his coffee. He simply couldn't stand food other than some caffeine to provide the jolt for waking up to face the outside world. After, of course, he engaged for a few minutes in his fantasy of being a writer. They had met in their junior year at the University of Maine in Bangor, had scandalized their very Catholic parents by living together their senior year, and then stilled that scandalizing by marrying a week after graduation. Kathy had been a secondary math education major, he a computer education major. He had taken his father's advice to get a degree that will get you a job, and chase the dream of writing afterwards. They had actually scored positions at the same school, in a suburb of Portland, teaching side by side for four years until Wendy came along. Kathy had taken a couple of years off for their first daughter, then gone back to teaching, until their midlife surprise of two years back. Every morning now he could see her duality. She adored being a full-time mother again, but as she handed him his cup of coffee to pack him off for another day at school, he could sense her longing, her missing of their kids at Joshua Chamberlain Middle School. The day was one of those glorious Maine autumn days. A touch of frost was on the car out in the driveway, and he remembered fondly their first year of teaching. Leaving the apartment, he would go out first, when it was down near zero degrees, to scrape the car and heat it up before she dashed to its warmth. Their daughter Wendy stood behind her mother. She bore such a striking resemblance to the family album photos of her mother at the same age. Lanky, long-legged, and coltish. Her red hair was tied back in a ponytail. Already the clear signs were there of the stunning beauty she would grow into, but she was still very much Daddy's girl, even though she tried not to let that show, especially around her friends. And she was obviously ticked off that Dad was running late. Her morning gossip circle awaited in homeroom. She could barely spare a quick glance to her dad as he pecked her on the cheek. Then she was back to her cell phone, texting away and chortling about how someone named Janie was definitely going to get it good today for being caught kissing the boyfriend of some girl named Hallie. He glanced at Kathy and said nothing. Wasn't that supposed to start when they were fifteen or so? Even though he taught middle school, he still looked at his charges as children, though popular culture had been putting girls, such as Miley Cyrus, at age fifteen on the cover of Vanity Fair for years. Kathy made no comment about the scandal at school as she tucked a packed lunch into Wendy's backpack, leaned up, and kissed Bob on the cheek. Have a good day. He kissed her back and looked over her shoulder to Shelley, their one-year-old, sitting in a high chair at the kitchen table. 
She was happily smearing her face and hair with chocolate pudding, laughing away at whatever was the inner delight of one-year-olds when putting on disgusting displays. Wendy spared a quick glance at her kid sister and gave a grunt of disgust. You were just as gross at that age, Bob offered. She simply rolled her eyes. I was perfect compared to that, Wendy bragged, but he could see a bit of an affectionate smile regarding the brat's display. Want to trade jobs for the day? Kathy sighed, eyeing Shelley, then back at the two of them heading off to school. You were the one who said it'd be fun to have another, he replied, a bit defensively. Yeah, was all he could muster out of her. Just one day, come on. You guys can stay here, clean up the smeared chocolate, change the diapers, watch that damn purple dinosaur dancing around on television, and I can at least have a five-minute intellectual conversation with some twelve-year-olds. She looked at the two wistfully, eyebrows raised, head tilted to one side, and with a trace of an impish smile, the look that could always nail Bob and leave him a bit weak in the knees, even after all these years. He realized she was actually half serious, and that if he said yes, she'd dash off to the bedroom, slap some makeup on, and be out the door with Wendy, telling their principal that she was his sub for the day. Wendy looked at her mother with sympathy, but her glance indicated that she also thought her mother's appeal must be insane. Intellectual conversation? Seventh grade? Come on, Mom, you gotta be kidding. Next year, was all Bob could offer. Not sure if she was really lamenting, or just trying to make them feel guilty as they headed out for another day in the world. Kathy smiled, that same winsome smile that had caught him on the day they met, when he could have sworn that her eyes actually sparkled with light the first time he gazed into them. She brushed back an errant wisp of red hair from her face, leaving a smear of chocolate pudding on her jawline and neck, which made him laugh softly and half kiss, half lick it off her. Don't do that she whispered so that Wendy, standing expectantly by the door, would not hear. You'll get me thinking, and I'm stuck here alone without you. Maybe tonight, he whispered. Come on, Dad, we're late. The two peeked over at their twelve-year-old standing at the doorway, who gazed at them with a look of exasperation and judgmental embarrassment at parents who act too affectionately. Kathy pushed him away. Get going. He paused, drawn to the television screen on the kitchen counter. Today's lead stories we're covering after the break. The shooting incident yesterday at Robert Morrison High School outside Syracuse, New York, that left four people dead and ten wounded is drawing increasing scrutiny with the report released at seven this morning by an anonymous official that the gunman had a letter on his body in Arabic that proclaimed that the time of the jihad promised by ISIS had come. Federal officials on the scene are dismissing the report and urging calm. All schools in the Syracuse area are closed for the day. Across the bottom of the screen, the ticker tape was providing a brief account of the deaths of three border security guards the night before near Austin, Texas, in what one witness claimed was a professional attack, and not just a random shooting incident. He took it in, saw the look of worry in Kathy's eyes. Anyone who taught in a public school, especially couples who taught in the same school, talked about, what if it happens in our school? He gingerly leaned over to kiss Shelley on the top of the head, making sure she didn't smear him with pudding. He wrinkled his nose. The kid stank, and he suppressed a gag. It was definitely one aspect of fatherhood he was an utter failure at, and he was glad that he was heading out the door rather than being called up for diaper service. "'You little monster, love you,' he sighed and gazed back at Kathy and smiled lovingly. Wendy was already at the car. "'I'm late.' was all he could say as an excuse, and was out the door into the chilly May-October morning. He looked back again and blew a kiss to Kathy, a tradition they had followed ever since the first night they had spent together. It was the last time they would see each other alive. Near Raqqa, Syria. Hashtag Dies Irae 631. Sword 1, 4 hours. Sword 2, 4 and a half hours. Allahu Akbar. Chapter 2, 7.45 a.m., near Portland, Maine. Bob parked the car that he and Kathy called The Indulgence in his usual spot at Joshua Chamberlain Middle School. The red 350Z seemed a bit extreme for someone getting by on the pay of a high school teacher, but they had purchased it used years ago before Wendy was born. In fact, just a couple of weeks before finding out Kathy was pregnant. The car had remained, even though it was totally impractical for a new family. 
The more utilitarian Subaru SUV took the parking space alongside it in the driveway of the small three-bedroom home they had purchased eight years ago. It was not the existence they had talked about when they first met and had fallen in love. The plan had been, after they married and landed their jobs at the middle school in a suburb of Portland, that after several years he'd go back to grad school, then leave teaching for a far better paying job in the corporate world. She would then pursue an advanced degree in math and teach at the college level. With that accomplished, perhaps his writing would even take off some day. Making it as a writer was, as they called it, a Cinderella fantasy, but it had sounded nice at the time. Then Wendy came along, and as is so typical of life, the game played out with the two teaching and saying to each other that in twenty-five years, when they could collect retirement and Wendy was off to college, they would resume those dreams. And then the midlife surprise of Shelley put that plan on further hold. As he made the motions of opening the car door to get out, he caught a few seconds of eye contact with Wendy, and he had no complaints. He and Kathy had a loving marriage, a rarity, it seemed, in this world, and two girls who were blessed with good health. Sure, it was a grind, going in early and staying late at school, and finances were tight with Kathy staying home, but at this moment, on this peaceful autumn day in Maine, his daughter flashed him a shy smile, and he felt blessed and grateful for it. I'm late, Daddy, Wendy complained as she opened the door and started to get out. Gone were the days of walking her into primary school, holding hands and sharing a hug. Perhaps she sensed his disappointment, because she glanced back at him and gave him a toothy grin, a reminder that the big expense to come this year would be braces. Love you, Dad, she offered, and then was off, running to the side of one of her friends. Wendy began showing a text message on her phone, which she'd have to shut down once inside the building, and both of them giggled, he sighed. Once she was out of sight, he opened the compartment between the seats. Something about the news today. No, not just today, the news every day of late had forced a decision that only Kathy knew about. He pulled out a Ruger three hundred eighty from the glove compartment and slipped it into his pants pocket. Even though he had a permit to carry a concealed weapon, he was now in felony violation of both federal law and the laws of the state of Maine. If discovered, he would lose his teaching license and face up to five years in prison. If found out, if found out by someone simply seeing the pistol, if it slipped out of his pocket as he squatted down to pick something up, if the pants he was wearing were a bit too tight and some sharp-eyed co-worker got suspicious and ran to tell the principal, the principal would summon him while calling the police, who would then come and pat him down, handcuff him, and take him to jail. If found out, he would be in prison, licensed to teach revoked for a lifetime, and pay fines. The national media would show a viral video of him being let out in handcuffs, the only crime more reprehensible in a school, to sexually stalk or use a student, which he felt did indeed deserve capital punishment rather than prison with rehabilitation therapy and a sentence that was likely shorter than the one he would face. Caught by a student wandering into his classroom after hours to find him having an affair with another teacher? Embarrassed dismissal. Embezzling? Perhaps a fine and quiet termination? Incompetence in the classroom, which he also felt was a crime worthy of punishment. As long as the incompetent teacher's students jumped through the hoops of testing, no big deal. When he did complain once about another faculty member who, as he said, could not figure out his IQ unless he looked at the bottom of his shoe, the response was, Mr. Iverson retires in six more years, so just let it go for now. Besides, the union would kick up a fuss. Being a teacher, Bob was at least able to force the issue with his own daughter by insisting on a transfer to another teacher, but for the other hundred kids stuck in Iverson's class day after day, well, at least in six more years he would be gone. The gun. Why the gun? He did not buy the years of administrative instructions coming from experts in the main office, while day after day he looked into the eyes of his students and inwardly asked, What do I do? if the nightmare came to Chamberlain Middle School. He did not buy the counterintuitive logic that if there were a gunman in the building, to lock the door, lie on the floor, and pray. Well, not actually pray, for after all this was a public school, but he could at least insist upon a moment of silence as they waited to get shot. In whispered conversations with only a few other teachers and Kathy, the conclusion returned again and again to the same point. 
Up until 9-11, all were drilled that if on a hijacked plane, sit back, relax, take a Xanax, listen to those in charge, and all would be well. Unless you were Jewish and the hijacker a Muslim, if so, ditch your passport and say your name is Smith. And then there was United Flight Number 93, the fourth hijacking on that black day of days. The cell phone calls informing the passengers on that doomed flight that it was time to fight back. They fought and died and in doing so likely saved thousands on the ground. After that day, he believed that it wasn't just the billions spent on security that had resulted in not a single hijacking in American airspace since 9-11. It was the fundamental realization that if anyone tried to take a plane, 200 ordinary Americans on that plane would fight back. That, more than any other factor, deterred the enemy who now sought other targets, in the same manner that so many had once learned that, rather than whine about a bully in an elementary schoolyard, the final and most convincing answer was to fight back on the spot. A comparison of the hijackings in the thirteen years prior to 9-11 versus after 9-11 to Bob was proof enough of how to respond. So he broke federal and state law this morning, the law that experts had said for years was the only answer. To be defenseless? To lock a door? To wait and pray? He could no longer believe that argument. In whispered conversations with others, he argued that he was a teacher and, above all other considerations, his first duty was to protect his students no matter what. If need be, he would face prison for doing that duty. Better that than to be passive as a sheep and watch as the lambs in his charge get slaughtered. He had not taken his decision lightly or in a cavalier manner, as some macho idiots would do. He had legally purchased the weapon and taken the required course to carry a concealed weapon, though of course it was illegal to do so on school property. Kathy had as well, for she was a teacher at the time they had made the decision. They then took the advanced courses offered by a local firearm store regarding safety and how and when to use the weapon he was about to carry into the school in violation of the law. In his mind, it was a moral choice. If ever the children in his charge were threatened, he believed that the first responsibility of a teacher, transcending all other responsibilities, was to protect. He popped the magazine, double-checking that no round was actually chambered in the weapon, slipped it back in, and pocketed the gun. It carried six hollow-point rounds and resided in a holster pocket that Kathy had sewn inside the right pocket of his jeans. That done, he exited the car, opened the back hatch for his book bag, and— in what was now an unconscious gesture, ran his hand down his right side to make sure the weapon was properly holstered and not visible. He walked into the school, ignoring the warning signs posted on all school doors that Joshua Chamberlain Middle School was a gun-free zone, and smiled a genuinely warm and friendly greeting to Charlie, the sixty-year-old security and resource officer who smiled a greeting in return. The two paused as Charlie asked about Miss Kathy, and they joked about the diaper he had avoided changing. He then traveled the short distance to his classroom and office in the IT wing, kids rushing past him laughing and locker doors slamming. It was the start of another typical day at Joshua Chamberlain Middle School, just outside of Portland, Maine. 8.45 a.m., Portland, Maine. They had driven up from Atlantic City, New Jersey, the day before, and stayed at a fairly upscale hotel just off the Falmouth exit of Interstate 95, arriving just after eight in the evening the day before. They had been admonished repeatedly in their training to make sure they had a good eight-hour sleep when the final hours came, but none had done so. Regardless of their faith, how could one sleep soundly when knowing it was the last night they would spend on this earth and, come the following day, they would die as holy martyrs, Regardless of all they had seen in their years of holy war, regardless of just how many they had killed, from putting the round of a Kalashnikov into the forehead of a grandmother who had closed her eyes in the final seconds, whispering a Christian prayer as she waited for death, to a screaming woman who knew her fate after being raped, to an infant whose throat was so easy to cut when asleep in the cradle, this they knew for certain. Their own time had come. The last hours of life were drawing to an end, their fears stilled by the promises of their caliph of what awaited them in paradise. How painful would death be? They had seen men and women burned alive, 
and the first time they had witnessed that, even though it was an infidel, there was a moment of flinching and wondering how one's flesh would smell if fate determined that they would die trapped in flames. How intense would be the pain? The caliph promised them that if trapped in fire as a holy martyr, the flames would feel as cooling as a mountain stream as they winged to paradise. Some had even driven the nails to crucify Christians, a most fitting death for those of that absurd faith. The infidels were too weak to do the same to them, but the thoughts did linger about the moment of their death. Would it hurt? Rather than pain, would it become bliss unlike any they had known upon earth, and be a foreshadowing of the eternal bliss given to one who died in jihad? All pleasures denied to them on earth would at last be theirs, pure women, ever virgin for their desire to never be taken before them and thus soiled by another man. If the woman given to them was not pleasing and submissive in all ways, they could be cast into oblivion at any time, for such women in paradise existed solely for the pleasure of holy jihadists. Awaiting them would also be boys with soft, pliant bodies and the faces of angels to be used as desired. There awaited every fruit to feast upon and fountains of strong drink as promised by the Prophet and his living envoy, the Caliph. Such thoughts now strengthened their hearts for the task ahead and stilled their fears, filling them with the joy of anticipation. The journey had begun six months ago, starting with a container ship out of a Middle Eastern port. No one involved in this plan had traveled by air. Thus they avoided the random chance of a database check, face recognition software, or a capture. Instead, over a hundred jihadists had departed their homeland on random dates, never in a group, using a roundabout journey to finally arrive at Veracruz, Mexico. With all of the attention focused on airlines, the obvious alternative was container ships where chances were less than 5% that the ship would even be checked. During the spring offensive of ISIS into Iraq, over half a billion in hard currency had been captured. Not just useless paper, but actual gold. Bin Laden had boasted that his day of glory had been purchased for little more than half a million in American currency. What could half a billion buy? Most certainly the cooperation of the drug cartels of Central America to help pass along, at a cost of two million each, the jihadists from the port of Veracruz to the mules and coyotes who would take them across the poorest border of America, half the fee on signing, half on delivery to their handlers in America. And unlike some financial deals engaged in by the cartels, even they were fearful of the wrath of ISIS if there were a betrayal or a failure. Only two conspirators had been waylaid while traveling through Mexico to the border. To show their good faith to the Middle Easterners, the cartel had cut the throats of those responsible, along with the federal police who had refused to accept the bribes to look the other way. All electronic chatter was to be silenced except for the final moments. All of the jihadists had their plans, their marching orders, their pickup points, their transfers, and their final missions. They knew whom they would link up with and where all was laid out and memorized before leaving the training center in eastern Syria. Nothing was in writing. Nothing was transmitted. All had absolute faith in their leader that they would bring their vengeance to America. Those who had doubted, those who had voiced concerns or who had tried to back away once initiated into the secret, were already dead and buried in unmarked graves in the desert. For nearly thirteen years there had been hundreds of boasts by other groups, other so-called jihadists, but no successful attack had been launched within the United States since 9-11. The few attacks planned and initiated had been intercepted because of their own foolish mistakes, but the boasting had served a purpose. It had lulled the enemy, it had lulled those who kept watch but were not allowed to tell the American media of their successes. Even more so, it had lulled the sheep of their society. The absence of a successful attack in more than a decade had lulled them to believe they actually were safe. Even if the enemy did see something suspicious, it had been drilled into them for years not to be rude, to be politically correct, not to point and shout a warning out of fear that they would be called phobic or racist. At the same time, the jihadists had learned from the mistakes of the once-respected bin Laden and those who followed him. 
They learned from the victories of their enemies because those victories often resulted in a repeating of the same actions over and over. Yes, they did have strengths with all of their technology, their drones and their cell phone call intercepts. Therefore, infiltrate the target as low-tech as possible. Approach with utmost stealth, like a shadow in the desert at night, and not brazenly walking under the noonday sun. In the preceding months, the way paved by money looted from the successful offensive into Iraq, there were careful transfers of each jihadist across the border. All fighters had been carefully screened and selected for the mission. Thousands of foreign fighters had joined the ranks of ISIS, some of whom were frustrated with the increasingly conservative ways of Al-Qaeda. The leader's main criteria for selecting his jihadists for this mission, their willingness to die in jihad, a rigorous vetting back to their birth, and numerous references to ensure that not one of them was an agent or traitor infiltrating from the West. They had to demonstrate a near-perfect ability to blend into the Western world. It amazed him how the attackers of 9-11 were, upon reflection, far too obvious. That risk would not be run this time. Their command of English had to be near flawless. They had to be able to put on a business suit, walk through a crowd, and no one would take a second look. If need be, they could even mimic adherence to an infidel faith and speak warmly of their love for Jews. This was no violation of faith, of course. The renowned scholar Al-Bukhari explained such logic when he commented on Surah chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran that, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. And, of course, there was Surah chapter 3, verse 54, which declared that the best deceiver of all was Allah himself. Such words were armor for the hearts and souls of his jihadists to infiltrate the evil heart of the West. Those who actually at some point in their lives had lived in the belly of the beast, the world of the infidels attending Western schools, he personally checked as to their faith and willingness to die as holy warriors. They had to show him their ability to fight and kill without second thought or mercy. During some of the thousands of executions in Iraq, he had made sure that those being considered for this attack took part in them. They were required to wield the knife for beheadings and drive the nails for crucifixions. No double agent would do this. If they blanched, they were no longer considered. Those who failed the tests were dead before the sun set. They were required to shave their beards, their clothing tailored by experts, learn to speak in the latest dialect of decadent America, and drill relentlessly on their created identities. In public, they would gossip about the latest game or whorish starlet, even drink a beer with dinner in a barbecue restaurant. If offered forbidden food, they were to eat it without hesitation. He reinforced the rulings in the Quran that those on jihad were exempt from all sins. Only in the privacy of their heart would there be prayers, until the final hour before the assault began. Until then, blend in with your foe so adroitly that he will not question. If there is a question, he will fear to ask it, because that is their culture. None of the targets was within fifty kilometers of a major city. That was another strength of their plan, to avoid the major cities where the random chance of passing someone on a street might trigger a recognition by someone trained well enough to recognize the wolf moving silently amongst the sheep. The caliph reinforced that the slightest failure or lapse in the United States would result in damnation and execution and, if shown to be egregious, their families would pay the price as well. Of course, there was always the random chance of something going wrong. A traffic accident, a drunk driver, perhaps an American veteran of Afghanistan or Iraq, who just might take a second look. And such an event did happen. An angry American veteran claimed he recognized a jihadist. The jihadist left the fast food restaurant with his American handler, the vet following and shouting a challenge. The handler reacted brilliantly and, as trained, shouting back that the American was a racist, even as he thanked him for his service to our country. His cries of racism prompted those who were standing nearby and watching to back off and to even offer apologies, warning the veteran to leave the two innocent men alone. Gradually, the thirty-plus teams came together around the country, going to ground several hundred miles or more away from what would be their final targets. The teams were made up of three to seven jihadists, depending on their target and mission. The cover of some was to attend a trade show or a convention. 
Others were on vacation, such as the team assigned to the state of Maine, which stayed for a week in Atlantic City, where they gambled and play-acted that they were rich Dubai bastards out for a little fun, while waiting for the countdown, waiting for the coded message that would not even be sent via the Internet. The message that the attack was to be unleashed was actually a news story about one of their leaders being executed as a traitor. After weeks of staying well hidden in the midst of the enemy, the news story came. It was first broadcasted by Al Jazeera that one of the top commanders of ISIS had been denounced as a CIA spy and beheaded. It was picked up by the American media within the hour. Fox News had experts on within three hours, speculating that a breakdown was occurring within ISIS, and perhaps the enemy was turning on itself. ISIS even released footage of the execution to lend credence to the story. The man executed had been marked by their leader for termination anyhow. His faith was wavering. The execution was the signal to initiate the attack two mornings later, just before noon, Eastern Time. No transmission, no internet, a news story as the only signal. The team assigned to Maine left Atlantic City that same day, skirting wide around New York City and staying within the speed limit, looking like five businessmen traveling to a conference and always speaking English. They purchased cell phones at convenience stores, but turned them off. They stowed golf bags in the back of the SUV for their vacation jaunt to Maine, while other teams headed to a beach house party in Daytona, a family reunion in Marietta, Georgia, a conference in Springfield, Illinois, a trip to see friends in Oklahoma City, and a trip to buy a boat outside of Seattle. The tools they needed had been carefully moved weeks earlier one piece, or several at a time. For the main team, an American handler who had been positioned far ahead of the jihadists, who would carry out the attacks, went to a famous mail-order house in Freeport for fishing supplies and then purchased additional equipment. American handlers, so-called sleeper agents, had infiltrated into America long before the plans for the attack were laid out and trained for, they were men with clean records who purchased guns across several months at gun shows or on the used market, never in bulk, just one or two at a time, and paid for with cash. Ironically, a number of weapons originated from the infamous Fast and Furious scheme, gleefully given to them by the cartels helping to transport jihadists across Mexico to the American border. The Kevlar bulletproof vests and other equipment were purchased one at a time from a number of different sources so as to not draw notice. Some were found on Craigslist. They moved the weapons to the more than 30 jump-off points for attack by tucking them under suitcases, inside golf bags, and among the overloaded vehicle of a family with several children in tow going on a vacation trip. The jihadists who would actually do the killing, until the day before the attack, were free of the encumbrance of a weapon in case of the random chance of being stopped. The handlers would be their drivers on the day of the attack, and if random chance resulted in their being caught prior to the attack, they would appear to be either gang members moving weapons for M13, or some other cartel gang, or just lone lunatics. But none were caught. Security had held so far. Each team worked in isolation. Only a few in ISIS knew the entire plan. If any one team was stopped prior to the day, the confession was the intent to shoot a plane down as it took off, thus focusing the typical American media panic on airports. They were forbidden under threat of eternal damnation to breathe the word of what they knew of the plan. But two broke that rule, one with a team north of New Orleans, the other in Las Vegas who got drunk and slipped up in public during an argument with an equally drunk Marine who was on leave and made a comment about damned ragheads. Las Vegas, which, as the heart of America's decadence, was one of the most ideal of targets and was coveted by all while in training. However, it was decided the attack in that region would hit in the area of Reno, sticking to the plan not to strike within any major city. As the brawl erupted, the fool had spoken in Arabic that soon the infidel would truly learn to fear, for the day of wrath was at hand. His comrades uttered apologies as they dragged him back to his room. The next day, at a cheap hotel on the far side of town, he died from an injection to simulate a drug overdose. The same was done to the too loquacious one in New Orleans. Speedball overdoses were, of course, part of the American scene. Overdosed bodies, even Middle Eastern ones, rarely drew notice beyond a local news report. 
So far, there had been no wider reaction. Such things surfaced in the news for a single cycle, then as quickly disappeared. In the final 48 hours, the teams moved to their strike positions. After months of planning, tensions began to run high, as they always do before battle. One team member had actually gone off half-cocked in Syracuse. For reasons the rest of his unit did not know, he had driven away from the hotel where they had rendezvoused that morning with the handler who had transported their weapons and equipment. He had slipped out, taking the handler's car, and hit their target on his own. This had sent out a ripple of warning. Before he was killed, he had murdered four and wounded ten. They had been trained for the possibility that one of their team might be spotted and captured, but not for one of them going off on his own crazed spree just hours before the real attack was to take place. The group immediately split up, going underground to sweat out the final twenty-four hours and not breaking silence. Each would now have to act on his own as best he could, but their main target was abandoned. As to the activity of the team south of Austin, which the American media was reporting as the murder of three border security guards, it had been a random pullover by Border Patrol that had resulted in the three agents being shot within seconds and the team fleeing. Disciplined, they had slunk into the desert to sit out the final hours before resuming the mission. So two out of the thirty-plus teams were in some state of disarray, but those in a hotel off the Falmouth exit near Portland, Maine, were ready. The cell phones had been activated, the Twitter account, long dormant, was activated, and the one lone tweet came in, time-stamped 745, hashtag DS Ire 631, four hours, sword one, four hours and a half hours, sword two, Allahu Akbar. There were three hours to go. The Falmouth main team contained units of both sword one and sword two. Each now sat on his bed and prayed in silence, for today would be his last day on earth, and tonight he would sup in paradise. 9.30 a.m., United States Central Command Office of Electronic Counter-Surveillance, McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida. T.S. Ira 631 back online, 11.45 hours Zulu time. Message, 4 hours, Sword 1, 4 and a half hours, Sword 2, Allahu Akbar. Tech Sergeant Quentin Younger, sipping his third cup of coffee of the morning, sat up in his chair and gazed at the screen. The endless scrolling of data which, on occasion, would suddenly highlight a tweet and color-code it for level of concern and need to report. This one was coming up red-flagged, meaning it needed a human review and not just a computerized review. It was a message plucked out of the hundreds of millions of monitored tweets flooding the world every hour. Quentin scanned the identifying information attachment to the message. It was an account set up nearly a year ago, some innocuous text messages back and forth, the last one a complaint about a lost bet regarding the World Cup. World Cup tweets were drawing some notice when originating out of Syria as coded messages, but there had been silence on the account since the games had ended. Someone up the food chain had pegged DS Ira 631 as a source of concern. He punched in a query to trace the followers. Several dozen were in Syria. There was talk several months back about the games, and one complaint about a failed encounter with a Belgian woman working in a medical aid station. Curious. There were new followers in the States as of this morning, all with hashtags of DS Ire with higher numbers. No responses, though. He checked those points of reception. All were accounts that were activated within the last two weeks purchased as cheap convenience store phones. Very curious. It was coming up on break time, and he yawned. Another curious item cropped up. Someone had codenamed the surveillance file for this account as DS Ire. What the heck? He punched in a Google search on the term. What was it, French, Spanish? Nothing significant. He scanned the line of possible alternatives. DS Ire was the third item, a Wikipedia article. Strange, something called a Gregorian chant. Latin. Day of Wrath, a hymn from the 13th century that became associated with the Great Plague of the 14th century. Great Plague. He had some memory of a high school history teacher talking about that. It was break time. The coffee had worked through him and he needed to go. Creepy stuff. Why would someone in Syria be sending messages around in Latin? 
They hated anything to do with that language, still cursing the crusaders of a thousand years ago as their excuse to commit murder today. Regardless, the hashtag was coded as a high priority, and he hit the send button to circulate a message received, warning that it was being followed by receivers within the states, and therefore would be bounced to NSA for further review. His job done, he got up for the restroom and silently cursed his hangover. 10.30 a.m., the White House. Dale Hinman took a second look at his screen, not sure if he was actually seeing it for real. Dies irae. He didn't know what it really meant, other than the fact that he was to kick the word up to the very top. He attached the email that was sent up from the NSA and forwarded it a very short physical distance to the center of this very building. Something was about to happen. The message was time-stamped 7.45 a.m. today. Whatever it was, Sword 1 would start at 11.45. He had done his job, let those down the hall in the Oval Office complex figure out what was next. Chapter 3. 11.10 a.m. near Portland, Maine. Shelley was down for her morning nap, thank God. Wendy had been such an easy child, Kathy thought as she carefully closed the door to the nursery. Or was it that she was now thirty-seven and no longer a new wide-eyed mom of twenty-five and still fascinated by every single thing her darling did? The news was on in the kitchen. More about the shooting in Syracuse. A video surveillance tape had just been released— the police alerted this morning by a hotel manager who, seeing the gunman's image from the school's security camera, had scrolled his own tape back and come up with a frightening match. The camera in the hotel was of the man leaving a back exit, and it was time-stamped only twenty minutes before the killings at the school. But what was far more disturbing now was the fact that less than thirty minutes after the incident hit the news in Syracuse, Five men, obviously Middle Eastern, had walked out the back door of the same hotel, gotten into a single car, and disappeared. One of them had shared the room with the gunman. All schools in Syracuse were closed for the day, and the city resembled Boston after the bombing of the marathon race, going into a full lockdown with every local and county officer in a manhunt, along with a National Guard military police unit being called in, as well as federal officials. The hotel video provided at least a black-and-white image of the car that the other five had left in, but no license plate number. Syracuse was in a state of panic. An impromptu rally of angry parents was ramping up in front of one of the closed schools, denouncing the school system for inadequate security due to the failure to provide new security locks on classroom doors that would bolt the doors shut. A parent speaking for the group, demanding the new bulletproof steel security doors, was standing outside the glass window of the typical one-story middle school building that stretched for a hundred yards. The fact that the lone shooter was stopped in the first minute of his attack by an off-duty police officer, who had come to the school early to pick up his son who was ill, did draw some notice and comment, and the officer was posthumously hailed as a hero. No one had noted nor emphasized the point that it was an armed parent, already in the school parking lot, who by lucky chance was there to stop the tragedy from becoming far worse. Kathy finally launched into loading up the dishwasher while the news shifted to the death of some reality show star. Disgusted, she clicked the volume down and logged onto her Facebook page to upload photos of Shelley's first birthday party from the weekend. Why was it the kid just loved to smear food? especially anything with chocolate all over her face and hair, and then just sit there laughing as she and Bob groaned with disgust. Cute photos, though. Some new posts were there. Friends from college and her own teaching days were discussing the incident in Syracuse. When Bob had told her of his decision several years ago to ignore all the rules and carry a concealed weapon, they had agreed it was wise to avoid any comment whatsoever on the issue on any social media and in any conversation that stood the remotest chance of being overheard, especially by Wendy, who had the typical loud mouth of a twelve-year-old. One never knew when the bounce back might hit. A post could be reposted in self-righteous angst about protecting our children and then forwarded to Bob's principal with the demand that he be checked out. The usual argument was raging between her friends— Mary Browning, her college roommate down in Austin, was in a fury over the entire ongoing immigrant crisis and was now upset over the killing of the three Border Patrol officers just south of where she lived. Another friend replied that Syracuse was proof that more trained security officers were needed in every school in the country. 
A tweet from Mary popped up on Kathy's pad. Just heard lots of sirens on Interstate 35. Kathy looked up to the television on the kitchen counter. There was a helicopter hovering above a highway near downtown Austin and a line of police cars. A high-speed chase was in progress, and she saw the caption read, Shooting in Austin Suburb. She turned the sound back up. We have live video now from our affiliate in Austin. Police are in a high-speed pursuit on Interstate 35, just north of the State Highway 290 interchange. There was no commentary for a moment. Someone in the New York studio gasped that it looked like gunfire coming from the vehicle being pursued. It sped past a tractor trailer, which suddenly jackknifed across the highway, taking out the lead police car. This is bad, it's bad, someone cried off camera. It looks like puffs of smoke or something impacting that red car heading southbound. Oh no, no! A southbound car, traveling in the direction opposite the vehicle being pursued, veered off the highway and rolled up onto its side as it slammed into the guardrail. The helicopter camera focused on that crash for a moment, then swung back to the jackknife truck, a police car tangled in the wreckage. Some of the pursuing vehicles were stopping, others were climbing up around the shoulder and accelerating to continue the chase. There was definite gunfire coming from that vehicle. It was the morning anchor speaking in a small box to one side of the screen. You can see the puffs of smoke. There. They've hit another car, that white SUV. My God, it looks like automatic fire. They've shredded that car. Kathy looked at the clock. It was 11.30. Bob should be on lunch break by now. The news in Syracuse and now this? It made her feel uneasy as she picked up her pad. You seeing the news? She texted to Bob. 11.32 a.m. Chamberlain Middle School, near Portland, Maine. As he walked into the faculty lounge, his cell phone beeped. It was a message from Kathy. Bob put his lunch bag down on a table in order to pull out his phone and check. He refused to keep his lunch in the faculty fridge. It was gross. The last time he looked, a bulging Tupperware container was ready to explode. Ed Winston, the eighth-grade science teacher, said it was an experiment, and if not, a hazmat team should be called in, but no one was volunteering to clean it out. He paused to look up at the small television in the stuffy and rather ill-kept faculty lounge. No one spoke. The television was always tuned at this time of day to an inane talk show, not as bad as the one that always wound up in fistfights, but nearly as bad. He checked Kathy's text. It wasn't the usual love you message or a report of some antic or complaint about Shelley. Hey, can we switch the channel? He asked, looking up at the screen. Two of the male faculty bent over their lunches, silently nodded agreement, but kept their heads down, saying nothing. Margaret Redding, as usual, held court here, and few dared to cross her. To interfere with her favorite program was cause for a war which she always won. Years ago, other faculty who shared the same break time had given up arguing. There was always the inevitable accusation later of inappropriate language, demeaning looks and attitude, or an offense that hinted at heinous crimes that would have to be dragged before the principal for arbitration or bumped up to the personnel office for the district. It was more hassle than it was worth, and never a victory, only another humiliation or... At best, a suggestion that the faculty form yet another committee to decide what should be on the television at which time. Of course, Margaret made sure that she ran that committee and that her show stayed on. You know I prefer this program, Margaret replied coolly, without even bothering to look at Bob. Without bothering to ask permission, he boldly walked toward the TV, looking for the remote control. He made eye contact with Margaret. The remote was resting on the lunch table, directly in front of her, and if he reached for it, there would be another incident. Margaret, I'm getting text messages from my wife that there's some breaking news. Let's switch the channel. No eye contact, only one word. No, nope. bitch. Of course he didn't say that out loud. He stared at the two other faculty in the room for support. Both of the men kept their heads down, ignoring the entire exchange. He touched his phone to an internet search and started to type in the address to one of the local stations. Bob, you know policy is that the faculty lounge is a computer-free zone during lunch hours, Margaret announced as she picked up the remote and made a show of turning up the volume on the television. 
The program showed several women sitting around a coffee table, voices raised in heated argument about whether a popular male star should divorce his cheating wife. She had been caught on a cell phone camera swimming nude and making out with another female star on a movie set in the Mediterranean. The video had been playing over and over on numerous websites for the last day. One of the commentators giggled slyly and suggested that of course her husband would welcome both of them back. He ignored Margaret and the asinine television belching out its mindless drivel and held his phone close to try and read a scrolling text across the bottom of the tiny screen, something about the incident in Austin. It was impossible to see, and his frustration was growing. He looked back at Margaret, who was putting the remote down so she could take another bite from her sandwich. Bob leaned across the table and snatched it. He turned and, to add insult to her injury, selected the local Fox station, which he knew she detested. She exploded with fury, accusations, and then threats. 11.35 a.m. Portland, Maine. The five gathered in one hotel room. The weather was cool enough that their long jackets did not look too out of place, but once into their vehicles, the jackets would come off. All were wearing full tactical gear black webbing with chest pockets holding extra magazines of 9mm hollow points. Kevlar vests were underneath the webbing, protecting them from neck to crotch from anything less than a heavy-jacketed armor-piercing round. They would leave in two vehicles, one a standard-size American-made car rented the day before by their handler from an agency near the airport. Three would go to their target in that vehicle. The other three would remain in the Tahoe, and drive the quarter mile to a nearby fast food restaurant, park in the back, and wait out the final minutes. The prayer for those about to become martyrs was short. The five faced to the east southeast. One of them had placed a small mark with a grease pen on the wall so that they were properly looking toward Mecca. That was all. No cries out loud, and no chance. That had been done for them the night before they left Syria. The few weeks of indulging in the decadence of their enemies had been merely a diversion without any stain of sin. For those who were to become holy martyrs, all sin would be washed away in the blood of their death as the prophet had promised them. There would be no pity now. The play acting of smiling at a child and commenting how cute he was when the toddler had grinned at one of them while they waited in line for a meal was over now. If any had inwardly blanched at the thought of what they would unleash in little more than fifteen minutes, they had been liberated of that conscience by participating in the spring offensive into Iraq. Each of them had been required to participate in the executions after villages and Mosul were seized. All had been singled out for a few days of training and practice on targets in a Christian neighborhood. The targets ranged from silent grandmothers who prayed as they awaited their fate to screaming mothers begging for mercy, to children younger than the smiling toddler in the restaurant awaiting a meal with a toy. Their actions in Mosul had been enough to desensitize them to any aspect of their mission. Their leader had lavished praise upon them and promised the paradise that awaited them. Their handler, who had infiltrated America more than a year ago, tapped on the door, signaling that the vehicles were ready and waiting. The five left the room, just a few feet from the side exit an Hispanic maid saw them advancing down the corridor and started to smile a greeting, but something about their demeanor caused her to back against the wall and stare at them warily as they passed. She knew without doubt that she saw with them the shadow of death passing by, a shadow that her grandmother had often spoken of when she was a child. She made the sign of the cross as they went out the door, then hurried to find the manager, driven by an instinct that something was not right with these men who had kept their room chained and barred during the two days they had stayed as guests, refusing entry even to have their beds made. Three heavy canisters were in the back of the black, late-model Tahoe. They popped the back hatch and shifted the canisters to the back seat of the smaller American car. The canisters contained six shoulder weapons— three primary weapons of 223 and three backup weapons of personal choice. Two had requested 12-gauge pumps, easily altered to hold six rounds with a mix of anti-personnel and heavier pumpkin ball ammunition for breaking down a door lock. The third preferred a short 45 semi-auto carbine that could be easily slung over the shoulder. The heaviest part of the burden being transferred was the thousand rounds of ammunition for each of their primary weapons, already loaded into 30-round magazines. 
Packed under the seats of the Tahoe were several thousand more rounds for the ubiquitous AK-47s for the second team, who would stay in the Tahoe. They were the Sword Two team, who would begin their attack a half hour after their brothers of Sword One attacked. No explosives were with their packages. The wise evaluation of their leader was that there was too much risk in acquiring and moving explosives. This decision had been argued. It was easy enough to buy black powder on the open market or, with a bit of training, learn how to convert a few bags of lawn fertilizer into explosives. The caliph, however, replied that such a move would be a tip-off and vetoed it with the strictest orders to not attempt any such purchases once in the heartland of the infidels. But it was easy and even amusing to assemble a couple of dozen small boxes that looked like IEDs during their final hours of waiting, boxes to scatter in the wake of their assaults and slow to a crawl any response by the infidels sent against them. They moved the shipping canisters into the second vehicle, drew the weapons and laid them into the rear of the vehicle for quick access, and readied the satchels for hauling the dozens of magazines of ammunition and fake IEDs to be instantly grabbed the moment they reached their target. They started to climb into the two cars. Excuse me, sirs, are you checking out? They looked up. It was the hotel manager coming out the back exit behind them. He looked Indian or Pakistani, his accent a giveaway. Slender, dark-skinned, he was all smiles, but obviously nervous. They had seen him looking more than once in their direction as they ate dinner the evening before in the hotel's small restaurant and bar. They had indeed aroused some instinct in him. He wasn't Hindu. He was a Pakistani Christian who had fled the region near the Afghan border with his family back in the early 1990s. He had raised his children as Americans and was grateful every day for the peace of this land. The sight of these men triggered some instinct of fear. It was their eyes. As a young man, he remembered fighters coming across the border during the Soviet war in Afghanistan, recruits flooding into the war zone from Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Syria to become jihadists and kill communists, but happy to kill Christians as well, even though the local Christian community ran a hospital for wounded refugees. These fighters had the same dead, shark-like eyes. The way one of them turned and faced him told him that even here, in America, in the state of Maine, which all assumed was far safer than places like New York or Chicago, was now as dangerous as the streets of his home village, as dangerous as Mosul, Tikrit, and Aleppo. It was the last thought of his life. Though nervous at approaching the men, they did not even give him time for that nervousness to turn to fear. Little more than three seconds after he asked the question, his brain was shattered by the impact of a single round to his forehead. His conscious thoughts did not even register the flash from the muzzle of the nine millimeter, fired from less than three feet away, nor did he hear the triumphal cry of Allahu Akbar. The two vehicles left the parking lot thirty seconds later. The maid, who had apprehensively stood in the doorway and watched, as her friend and manager innocently walked into his death, collapsed to her knees, screaming and calling out to the Blessed Virgin, while another maid, a refugee from the madness of Ethiopia who was far more used to the sight of cold-blooded killings, began to fumble a call to 911. Chapter 4 11.43 a.m. Near Portland, Maine Kathy looked up from her pad. She had been trying to connect to her friend Mary in Austin, Texas, texting her, while her attention remained glued to the television where the murders along Interstate 35 near Mary's neighborhood were continuing, and the ticker along the bottom of the television reported a second shooting incident in Syracuse. Apparently an accomplice of yesterday's school shooter had been cornered in the parking lot of a shopping mall. Kathy heard a siren, a police car racing past on the state highway, one block over from her home. Seconds later a second police car followed. It sent a chill down her spine. What was going on? A third police car, seconds later. Fear. Her heart constricted, beating faster. Surely this was not all interrelated in some way. She and Bob had shared whispered conversations often enough after Wendy was asleep as to the possibility that some horror could indeed happen here, and what was their drill, their response. They had talked about it scores of times, but were those fears and whispered conversations now triggering her into an overreaction? 
She texted Bob again, turn on the news now. He had not responded so far. 11.44 a.m., Joshua Chamberlain Middle School, Portland, Maine. He had made the mistake of setting the remote control back down on the table, a gesture of long habit when watching a program with Kathy, who on their second date had accused him of being a typical male because he hogged the television remote control. Margaret Redding snatched it back, switched the channel back to the program she had been watching, clutched the remote and glared at him defiantly, all but begging him to try and make a physical grab for it. She had already announced that she was filing a complaint of harassment, that to even try and touch her to get the remote would be a career ender for certain, and she was egging him on to do so. There was a flicker of a smile of the self-righteous professional victim who sensed that she just might have one hell of an excellent case if she could push him just one step further. At the very least, in a few more minutes, she would waddle out of the lounge, crying, head to the principal's office, and then take the rest of the day off due to the fear and anxiety he had created by his aggressive, dominant behavior. What the hell? It was Vince Rossignol, the quiet, introspective English literature teacher who, as always, studiously avoided involvement in any confrontation with Margaret. Bob thought Vince was standing up and stepping in at last to the confrontation with the tyrant, as all whispered when she was not present, of the faculty lounge. It'd be a two-to-one vote as to who controlled the television, and a witness that he had not physically touched Margaret. Vince standing up might be a crucial point to argue after school when, yet again, he was summoned to the office to answer Margaret's accusations. But Vince was not facing them at all. He was at the window, splitting open a couple of the dust-covered blinds and looking out to the front of the school. A blue sedan had pulled up directly by the walkway entrance, in a no-parking or standing zone. Three men were piling out, dressed in black, reaching into the back seats and pulling out satchels to sling over their shoulders. One of them stood straight up. He was holding a rifle aloft in one hand. "'What in the hell are those sons of bitches doing?' Vince cried, his voice rising and cracking. Margaret turned her wrath away from Bob to begin chiding Vince for his inappropriate use of language on school grounds, a definite violation as well. Then went silent. Are those guns? They aren't allowed to do that, she cried. Bob turned away from the television to look out the window. Merciful God in heaven, it's happening, he gasped. The three men rushed toward the front entrance. The way the wing of the main building was angled toward the parking lot and main entrance, Bob could see the front entrance, which was less than a hundred feet away. Charlie, their elderly security and resource officer, was actually exiting the front door, his only weapon a taser and pepper spray, both of them still latched and buttoned securely to his belt. In these first seconds, Bob simply could not react. Though the analogy was something from before his time, he remembered reading how some folks described such a moment of frightful shock as being like an old record that kept skipping and playing the same line over and over. This can't be real, this can't be real, this can't be real. It became very real when the leader of the group slowed, raised a pistol, and calmly put a nine-millimeter hollow-point bullet into Charlie's head from twenty feet away, the old man collapsing like a broken doll. Jesus Christ, this is it! Bob cried, but it took several seconds for him to reach into his pocket for his Ruger. Margaret started to scream, backing up against the wall, ironically still clutching the television remote control. Vince turned back from the window, gasping, and began to sag against the window frame, sobbing, already in a state of shock at the sight of the back of Charlie's head exploding from the impact of the round. Bob had played this scenario out in his mind hundreds of times, Nearly every day that he walked down the corridor to his office and classroom area, he'd ask himself, What do I do if... What do I do? But he had never played this one out in his mind. What do I do if I am in the faculty lounge, it's lunchtime, and not one but three gunmen storm the building, burdened down with multiple weapons and blow the brains out of our kind elderly security guard on the front lawn of the school as their opening move? Thoughts started to race, and his mind on the edge of panic finally latched onto one. Where is Wendy? Is she already in the lunchroom, or is it math class? God, what time is it? Where is she? Where is my daughter? 
A bell started to ring, loud, insistent, piercing. Was it the lunch bell, or the alert for lockdown? Now a flurry of shots thundered down the hallway, screams. Margaret turned and actually managed to lock the door to the faculty lounge. Get away from the door, Bob commanded, holding his pistol up and chambering around, but still not sure where to go. Margaret's gaze fixed on the small pistol in his right hand. More gunfire sounded from down the corridor, echoing like firecrackers. Screaming. More screaming. Children's screams. You can't have a gun, Peterson. I'll report you for this. Shut the hell up, bitch, and clear the door, he snapped, grabbing her by the shoulder and shoving her bulky frame to one side. He unlocked the door and opened it. Whatever instincts were still working for him, he knew he had to do something, at least for his daughter. He took a deep breath. At last, some flash of clarity settled in. His instincts as a father and a protector overrode everything else. He stepped into the corridor. The alarm for lockdown was sounding, reverberating, making it hard to think. On the far side of the main office complex was the wing for the gym, dining hall, library, science labs, his own IT office, and more classrooms. Behind him, doors to classrooms were opening up. In spite of the drills held at the start of the year before the students arrived, a fair number of teachers were reacting in the opening moments with curiosity rather than as they had been trained to do. Surely this could not be real, they were asking themselves and each other. A mistake? Bob heard someone shouting that question. Was this all a mistake or for real? Another shouted that some damn idiot of an administrator had gone over the edge and decided to pull an actual real drill with firecrackers included. If so, heads would roll after this one. Bob glanced back in the opposite direction of the gunfire. Where was Wendy's fourth period classroom? Was she in the lunchroom or still in math? The door to her math classroom was a few feet down the corridor and across from the faculty lunchroom. The door was closed, lights off. My God, had they gone for lunch and she was on the other side of the building with the murderers between him and his daughter? Suddenly an explosion of shots rang out and glass shattered. He whipped his head around toward the office complex and saw the large glass window of the front office break apart, broken glass cascading down, screams coming from within. He caught a glimpse of the principal, Mr. Carl, gentle soul, who insisted on wearing a bow tie which Bob thought made him look rather nerdy. Kids might say behind his back that he was somewhat dorky, but they all knew he had a loving heart. He was stepping out into the junction of the main corridor with the office complex. How many times had Bob argued about this moment, what to do if a gunman hit their school? Carl always replied that they would follow policy as they had been trained to do. According to his training, Carl was to be in his office calling the police and sounding the alarm. But he must have been down in the lunchroom. A group of children appeared at the end of the hallway, a class that had been heading to the lunchroom, and in those first seconds their teacher turned them back. Carl shouted for them to run for their classroom. A split second later several bullets exited his back, and he sagged. The man was using his body to shield the terrified children even as he died. The group was running toward Bob. More shots resounded. God in heaven, it was Wendy's class. They were being led by their teacher, Patty Carlson, a first-year teacher still fired up with idealism about her profession. But there was no three-credit course at the State University to train her for this moment. All of the other courses she had been required to take were now meaningless. There was much he had to process in the next few seconds. Carl was down. Several children he had tried to shield were collapsing. Was that Wendy? The bright pink designer scarf she was so proud of. A birthday present from her mother was around her neck. The scarf made her stand out, and it filled him with terror that it would draw the attention of the killers as well. She was at the back of the line of panicked children running toward him. He saw a dark form at the end of the corridor, bulky, dressed in black. The man's shoulder weapon was raised. He aimed straight at the backs of the fleeing children. Flashes, an explosion of rounds. Children at the end of the fleeing group dropped one after the other, shot in the back. There was an instant of silence, then the sound of a magazine dropping. I should charge him and shoot, the thought screamed at him. An instructor, when he took training, talked about muscle memory, of learning to react by instinct. The horror and confusion of it all was so overwhelming that he simply had not raised his pistol yet. 
All attention was focused on Wendy as he instinctively started toward her to pull her to safety wherever that might be. He caught a glimpse of Wendy. She was down. But then coming back up, knocked over by the child directly behind her who had been shot. Her math teacher turned back to grab her, shepherding her children, physically placing herself at the end of the line to shield them, pushing them toward her classroom. The gunman slapped another magazine in, started to aim it down the corridor, and then, as if distracted, turned to his left and popped round after round at a range of but a few feet into a terrified group of children who were streaming out of the gym, trying to flee to their classrooms for lockdown as their teacher had trained them to do. Wendy was up, shoved forward by Patty. Bob grabbed her by the arm, placing his body between her and the killer before the gunman's attention returned to them. And together they bolted into the perceived safety of her classroom, slamming the door shut behind them and locking it. More shots rang out in the hallway, then screaming, then a distinctive cry, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and that focused Bob at last. This was not some random shooting, some cowardly son-of-a-bitch lone shooter, or even a team of two or three psychotics. With their triumphal cries, he knew with absolute certainty that this was not the lone, crazed, sick shooter of the American scenario, the American nightmare ever since Columbine. It was Russia, 2004. This was the Chechnya scenario, the Beslan School Massacre of 2004, the worst nightmare of all his nightmares as a teacher. The Beslan School Massacre in the southern Russia province of Chechnya was a deliberately designed mass murder, the perfect storm of a terrorist mentality that viewed infidel children as tools to terrorize the enemy before sending all of them to hell. A handful of Islamic murderers, who claimed they were fighters for an independent state, seized the school in the Russian province on the first day of classes, which by Russian tradition was a time of celebration, proud parents taking their children to school and bringing small gifts of flowers and fruit to the teachers. But rather than a school opening with ceremonies and children singing traditional folk and patriotic songs, the day began with armed terrorists storming and seizing control of the building. First they herded the male teachers and older male students to a back room and systematically cut their throats to eliminate any chance of resistance. It was an attack designed to terrorize a nation, and the next step transcended anything even the Nazis had done to cower a population. Girls as young as ten were dragged to the roof of the building, over which news helicopters were hovering and reporting on the attack. Several terrorists held a child down as one of their fellow freedom fighters raped the child, and then, while raping her, cut her throat. The Russian government, which still controlled its mass media, immediately shut the media links down with the concern that, whether it was right or wrong, the sight of this depravity might trigger a frenzied counter-response. The intent of the terrorists was to arouse a religious war between Orthodox and Muslim, and to instill panic across the entire nation. Children caught up as pawns in that nightmare hell were then herded into a gym for what became a standoff of several days. The hostages were trapped in sweltering heat, with no food or water, so that many turned to drinking their own urine to slake their thirst. In the final conclusion of the horror, when security forces stormed the building, the terrorists, with a final cry of Allahu Akbar, detonated explosives ringing the roof of the gym, collapsing the structure. Over three hundred innocent victims died. It was a nightmare scenario that had lingered with Bob across the years. He had warned of it, and with the shouts of triumph out in the hallway, he knew it had indeed come to his school outside of Portland, Maine. He scanned the classroom. Children were sobbing. One girl was screaming hysterically, cradling a shattered arm as a young boy, who seemed so calm, was wrapping a belt around her upper arm to make a tourniquet. A kid with some Boy Scout training, he thought. Another explosion of shots, rapid fire, echoed, and there was more screaming out in the hallway. He looked about, still clutching Wendy to his side. The Ruger was in his right hand, still unused. Six shots of a lightweight pistol against what they were carrying? It might have worked against some damn crazed bastard like the one who had shot up the school in Connecticut. But now? There was more gunfire. The main lights in the hallway flickered off, 
A fire alarm began to shriek, and seconds later sprinklers in the hallway came on. Emergency lights switched on and flashed, adding to the terror and confusion. Clear, clear your thoughts, he kept repeating to himself. A glimpse out the window of the classroom door revealed a child lying in the hallway, twitching spasmodically. Another child started to get up, and then the back of her head just exploded. God in heaven, where are you? he cried. More shots went off in the corridor. It sounded like one of the killers was coming closer. He stepped away from the door, checking the room. The windows. The classroom faced west to the open playing yard and ball field. There were children out there in gym clothes, a teacher, one of the coaches herding them together. God, don't bring them back in, run the other way. He went to a window. The upper part was standard safety glass, and a small hand crank controlled a lower window that could not open more than a foot wide. More gunfire reverberated in the hallway, then screams. The gunfire sounded as if it were receding, then was followed by a long, rapid burst. My God, they're beginning to move room to room. The decision was near instant. Out the windows, he shouted. Paddy, standing in the corner, surrounded by nearly a score of trembling children, stared at him wide-eyed. We're supposed to lie down, Bob. Out! Get out! he screamed, trying to pick Wendy up with one arm and force her into the narrow escape of the crank-open window. She was kicking in panic, refusing. He pulled her back, set her down, pocketed the pistol, then picked up a student desk and slammed it against the plate-glass window. It recoiled back in his hand, but the window cracked. The children flinched. Damn it, break! He hit it again, slamming the desk in, and the window finally shattered, safety glass breaking apart, a few fragments still clinging to the frame. Wendy ran to him and clung to his neck. Wendy, get out and run. Run and don't stop. Don't look back. Just run for the woods over there on the far side of the field. Daddy, go! He struggled to break her grasp around his neck, and then to his horror, saw that the coach out in the field with safety only a hundred yards away, had actually rounded his students up into a group and was standing in the play yard, hesitating, looking toward the building as if some part of it would still give safety. A long burst of fire erupted, and the children outside began to drop. The group broke apart, running in panic. As they scattered, several ran to the parking lot but were cut down, collapsing into small, bloody heaps. One tried to get up and was hit yet again, the shot demonstrating the utter lack of mercy. Wendy saw it all, twisting, writhing to get out of his grip, screaming that she did not want to go outside. The months of training were now making it all so easy for the holy warriors of the Caliph. Two were to first hit the main entrance, kill the staff in the central office area, and any ridiculous security man who might have a pistol locked away in his office. One of the two would then hold the entrance while the second covered the back entry, shooting down any who tried to flee that way and keeping their prey pent up in the building. The emergency exits out of the gym and dining hall were then easily blocked by hanging several fake IEDs on the doors and announcing that as long as they stayed put, no one would be hurt, that if any tried to open the doors, they would all be blown apart. The third would then methodically begin to work his way down the two main classroom corridors, the wings of the building that contained 538 students and 37 staff and teachers. Once the classrooms were wiped out, attention would then be focused on those cowering in the gym and dining hall for the second stage of their plan. All of the information they needed in laying out the plan for this school had been garnered from the school district's website, from photographs of the interior posted by students, by a new math teacher proudly showing off her classroom, and by photographs and video clips of school plays, festivals, and sporting events. How these Americans love to film and post their children's sporting events, and provide so many details for a trained eye planning to kill them all. There were even blueprints and photographs of the newly built classrooms from 16 years ago, showing the design and layout of their new school. After seizing the main office complex, they knocked out the electricity and activated the fire alarms, setting off sprinklers to add to the confusion. With that done, the work now commenced of moving from classroom to classroom. A local police car pulled up to the curb in less than four minutes, summoned by the frightened call of the principal's secretary, who did as she was drilled to do, get that call out immediately. And then she died. The officer clambered out of his vehicle and saw old Charlie sprawled out on the walkway. 
There had been intense debate in the years since Columbine, renewed after Newtown, as to how the first officer on the scene of a school shooting should react, wait for backup or charge straight in. The argument had shifted to rushing the building, since most of the killers at the sight of a police officer often shot themselves and ended the madness. The local police chief told his personnel that they'd have to make their best judgment call when they arrived on the scene. As for himself, if he knew children were about to die at the hands of some damn lunatic, he would go in and to hell with waiting for backup. Every second meant a life saved or lost. So the first officer there, hearing the gunshots and screaming, knew he had to go in. The call from the secretary had not been clear, just a scream that there was a shooter in the building. Then the sound of gunfire was followed by the signal cutting off, and the near hysterical 911 dispatcher shouting the news onto the police circuit. So he moved forward, the jihadist waiting for him, chuckling at how amateurish the man was. The jihadist switched his weapon from full auto to single shot and put a well-aimed round into the man's head, dropping him next to the foolish old security guard. The sight of the two dead bodies would give the next approaching officer reason to pause. In order for the plan to work well, to achieve all that they wished to achieve, they needed the next hour free of interference. The leader of the three holy warriors clicked on the phone he was carrying, no more need for security regarding that, selected the website to the local news station, and smiled as he saw that their regular programming had been interrupted. They were already reporting an incident that appears to be unfolding at Joshua Chamberlain Middle School. It truly was going according to plan. Bob clutched Wendy, watching as the children outside scattered across the playground area, while out in the hallway he could clearly hear the gunfire erupting in a classroom across the corridor and one doorway down from the faculty lounge area. He heard loud screams, prayers, begging, relentless shooting, and repeated cries of Allahu Akbar. If they were following a pattern, this room would be next. He hugged Wendy fiercely and kissed her on the cheek. Wendy, you've got to run. You've got to run as fast as you've ever run. Go to the woods across the field now. Run! He tried to force her slender body through the shattered window. She began to kick and struggle, slicing her knee open on the edge of the shattered glass in the window frame. Daddy, no, I want to stay with you. He forcefully pulled her loose from her death-like grip around his neck. I love you. Tell Mommy and Shelley I love them. Now run! He threw her out the window so that she landed sprawling, scrambling to her hands and knees, sobbing, a look on her face as if he had brutally rejected her. She actually started to try to climb back in. Damn you, Wendy, listen to me. I am ordering you to run. Do it! He tried to force an angry gaze as if furious with her, to frighten her even more than the horror of what was around her. She looked at him, shocked, and stepped back, then winced as the sound of gunfire echoed around her. Run! She turned away and finally began to stagger across the play yard. I love you, sweetie, he whispered, then turned back to face the others in the room. Patty, listen to me. We've got to get all these kids out. Bob, we shouldn't. We can't. Her face was stunned at what she had just witnessed. Damn it, Patty, do it. Bob, we're not supposed to. She was in shock, beyond the ability to reason, and crucial seconds were ticking by as brutal death approached. He glanced around the room, saw the boy who had struggled to put a tourniquet on his bleeding classmate. Your name, son? Johnny O'Sullivan. You a Boy Scout? More gunfire out in the hallway than the sound in the distance of a siren at last. Yes, sir. Son, I want you to run. Tell the police there are three gunmen. They are Muslim terrorists, most likely armed with automatic weapons who plan to kill everyone inside. You got that? Before the boy could make a reply, Bob picked him up and unceremoniously dumped him out the window. Then the gunfire hit the door of the classroom, the rounds easily piercing it. More screaming, a child in the middle of the room was cut down. He stepped up against the wall alongside the doorway, drawing his weapon back out trying to remember if he had chambered around in the semi-auto he was holding. He pulled the slider back, and an unfired bullet popped out. Damn it! He had chambered around, but in the confusion forgotten he had done so. A damn amateur move. The bullet, one of only six rounds in his possession, rolled across the floor. Damn it, pick it up later, you've only got five left. He waited for the door to swing open. Near Portland, Maine.
My God. Oh, my God. Kathy Peterson stood transfixed, watching the local news feed. We repeat, there are reports of a shooting incident unfolding at Chamberlain Middle School. Our ICAM helicopter is racing to the scene and should be there any moment. The video feed from the helicopter was on, focused forward as the pilot swung northeastward, flying parallel to I-95. The highway was filled with police cars responding to the terrified calls coming in from the school. We also now have a confirmed report of a fatal shooting at a hotel by the Falmouth exit that may be related. This appears to be a frightful tragedy unfolding just outside of Portland, Maine. The reporter paused, touching her earpiece, nodding. As soon as we have a helicopter over Chamberlain Middle School, we will come back on, but now we have this urgent news release from our main studio in New York. The image shifted, but Kathy was no longer watching it. She was running into Shelley's room to rouse her from her nap. A tragedy of national proportions appears to be unfolding across America at this moment, the report echoed from the kitchen television. We now have confirmed reports of three schools, one near Austin, a second in Bakersfield, California, and a third near Portland, Maine, that appear to be under attack. In a minute or so, we should have a live helicopter feed from the school in Maine. She had Shelley out of her crib, the toddler fussing to be woken up so rudely, and feeling her mother's panic started to cry. Kathy wasn't sure what to do, but to stay here was not the answer. She returned to the kitchen. Holding Shelley, she used her free hand to call Bob. His laughing voice came on. Hey, busy at the moment, but leave a message and someday I'll get back to you. Bob, find Wendy and get the hell out of there now, she screamed. She hung up, attention focused back to the television report. Just a moment, just a moment. We are getting a fourth report now from our affiliate in Charlotte, North Carolina, of an elementary school in Hickory, North Carolina. Numerous gunshots, a police officer dead in front of the school. The reporter in the New York studio turned her gaze from the camera. The steady professional composure of a national-level news anchor shattered as she turned to look off camera. Everyone in this studio, shut the hell up, she yelled. I want accurate reports only. I only want accurate reports coming out of here. Now do your jobs! The reporter looked back to the camera, obviously shaken. My apologies. We are trying to sort this out as it comes in and to avoid panic. A second reporter came on camera, a popular anchor of the station's mid-afternoon news program, sitting down beside her and trying to appear calm. She gratefully acknowledged his presence. He was well known for having been a reporter who had gone in with the troops in the 2003 campaign into Iraq and had repeatedly been under fire. He deferentially held up a sheet of paper, offering to hand it to her, but she nodded for him to read the report. I've just been handed a copy of a report from our affiliate station in Billings, Montana, and I quote, A siege is unfolding at an elementary school in the northwest section of that city, there appears to be a coordinated attack now underway against at least five of our nation's elementary and middle schools. It is obviously a terrorist attack on our nation's children. We promise to keep you abreast as the situation unfolds. We now have a feed from our affiliate in Portland with a news helicopter over... He looked down at a note someone had handed to him. Chamberlain Middle School. The few seconds that she took to watch triggered a sob of pure horror in Kathy. It was an aerial shot of the playground, the playground where Wendy took recess every day when the weather was good, a place of swings, of slides, and of monkey bars, where in winter snowball fights were forbidden but broke out anyway. Oh, God, Wendy, my baby, Kathy gasped. The playground now looked like a war zone, which, in fact, it was. The camera swung across half a dozen small bodies sprawled in the yard, revealing red splotches, pools of blood, children crawling, a teacher crouching low and carrying a child. And then, live, for all the nation to see, the teacher went limp, a puff, a mist of blood and clothing burst out of him, both he and the child going down. The camera began to zoom in, but then pulled back, as if it were too horrific to be seen. The reaction was almost as instinctive to not gaze too closely upon the horror, in the same way that cameras were finally turned away on 9-11 when, by the hundreds, bodies plunged down the faces of the north and south towers of the World Trade Center. But this time it was children who were dying. Kathy's phone rang. Bob! She almost dropped Shelley, who was kicking and squirming while sliding the screen of the phone on. 
No, it was not Bob's ringtone. It was her friend Mary Browning in Austin. My God, Kathy, are you guys okay? I don't know. I don't know. I just saw on the news it was your school. What is going on? I don't know. I just saw it, too. They're hitting a school in Austin. Not my son's, but I'm going to get him now, she cried. They're hitting every school in the country. Mary, I can't talk. I'm going to get Wendy and Bob. She clicked the phone off and ran out the door. She realized that she still held Shelley in her arms. It was kicking and sobbing. She turned to her neighbor's home. The Andersons? She didn't know them well. They were an older couple, their kids were off to college, and the mother Elizabeth apparently stayed at home. That was about all she knew of them. A car was in the driveway. She ran to the house, rang the doorbell, waited a few seconds, then abandoned social convention and tried the doorknob and burst in. Kathy? What in God's name? Elizabeth stood at the top of the stairs, hair disheveled, wearing yoga pants and a t-shirt, and was obviously confused. She most likely was enjoying the luxury of a nap while the world was going insane. Have you been watching the news? No. And there was a slight edge of annoyance to her voice. I was sleeping. She descended the flight of stairs and was startled as Kathy stepped forward to try and hand off Shelley, who was now worked up to a fever pitch of crying. Take Shelley, please. I've got to go. I've got to get to the school. She literally shoved Shelley into Elizabeth's arms so fiercely that the older woman actually did clutch the child. Kathy, what is going on? Calm down. I can't calm down. Watch Shelley, please, and turn on the news. She turned and ran out the door, leaving it open, jumping into the SUV. She fumbled with her pockets, then cursed foully. The keys. She ran back into the house, leaving her front door open and grabbed her purse, opening it. The keys were within, and also the Ruger that was identical to Bob's. She pushed the weapon into her pocket, and as she did so, she heard Shelley screaming nearby. Kathy turned to see Elizabeth entering the doorway eyes going wide at the sight of Kathy pocketing the small weapon. Merciful heavens, Kathy, are you going insane? And Kathy could see the woman was actually afraid, and even protectively clutching Shelley tight against her shoulder. The world is insane, she cried, pointing at the blaring television. She shouldered her way past Elizabeth and jumped into the car. Seconds later, she was tearing down the driveway and was nearly T-boned by Denise Kilgore, another mother, whose only child was in first grade at McAuliffe Elementary School several blocks away from Chamberlain. All across the neighborhood, dozens of parents were getting into cars, tearing down driveways and office parking lots, and flooring it to McAuliffe Elementary, Perry High School, Chamberlain Middle School, not just in Portland, but also to Oak Grove School in Vassalboro, Maine, to Tecumseh High in Lafayette, Indiana, to Jackson Elementary in Salem, Oregon, to thousands of schools across the country. The panic was on just as the caliph had prophesied to his followers. A news report from a school in Toledo, Ohio, came on the abandoned television, which reported a lockdown and shooting with one person dead so far. A possible attack, another similar report, came out of Savannah, Georgia. Both were actually panic-stricken parents, pulling up in front of their child's school and leaping out of their vehicles. Those two unfortunate people were both openly carrying guns, and ignoring the shouted warning of panicky police officers who were racing to every school around the country, believing that they were arriving only seconds ahead of, or just behind a potential attack, both parents were shot dead in a fusillade of fire. It would take hours to sort out that they were not terrorists, only frightened parents, but their deaths added to the tally of schools reported as being under attack. Inside Joshua Chamberlain Middle School the door to Bob's classroom burst open and the terrorist, the barrel of his assault weapon poised low from the hip, stepped halfway into the room with a calm arrogance. He fired a shot to kill a child, the one already wounded in the arm and huddled in the corner of the room. Bob leveled his palm-sized Ruger at him and fired from less than three feet away. Shaking, he missed, missed completely. His startled enemy actually stepped back. This was not supposed to be happening. The infidels were cowards, sheep. How could this be? He started to swing the muzzle of his rifle toward the side of the door to fire through the flimsy plaster walls. Bob stepped forward, this time nearly pressing the muzzle of the Ruger into his opponent's face and squeezed the trigger. The shot caught the man in the jaw, shattering it in a spray of blood and teeth. With a strangled cry, the attacker fell back into the hallway, cursing, and a rapid spray of gunfire invaded the classroom. Every remaining window in the classroom shattered. 
Children huddled in the corner out of the way of the barrage. Bob could actually see shell casings ejecting out in the hallway, but the murderer whom he was certain he had hit was not visible. Come on, you pig, you son of a bitch, come on in, Bob taunted. No response, only labored breathing, choking and spitting, then the sound of a magazine dropping. It registered in his mind, but he did not have the instinct to react swiftly. Something told him that if he reacted instantly, he would catch his enemy reloading, reeling from the shock of being hit and finish him. But he did not have the training to instantly press his attack, and he remained frozen in place for several crucial seconds, pistol raised, as if expecting his enemy to foolishly step into his line of fire yet again. His opponent was still out in the hallway, heavy, raspy breathing, gasping for air, gagging as if choking, and in that crucial moment hesitating as well in disbelief that he had actually been wounded by a damned infidel. He slammed in a loaded magazine and chambered around, the sound of it loud and clear to Bob over the wailing of the fire alarm, the cries of the children, and the hissing of the sprinklers. Come on, you pig-eater, Bob screamed, trying to provoke him. There was a grunted response, and a shout from down the hallway sounding like a command from one of the other killers. Several seconds of silence followed. Bob waited tensely. Surely they had grenades of some kind, and Bob was waiting for one to bounce into the room. He caught a glimpse out the window, hoping to see a reflection of who was in the hallway, but all of the windows had been blown out. He heard shooting outside, the sound of sirens now, and what must be a helicopter. Maybe that was help at last, a SWAT team or something? Wendy. He couldn't see her. Don't lose focus. Your death is on the other side of that open doorway. He actually had a reflective thought, amazed with how many thoughts struck him, that he knew what they meant about one's life flashing before them in their final seconds. That realization was a warning. He fell to the floor, and as he did so, the wall space where he had been standing a second earlier was stitched by half a dozen bullets, plasterboard exploding across the room. He caught Patty's gaze, her surviving children clustered in the corner of the room around her. He motioned for them to stay down on the floor. They were all pinned, their unseen killer obviously injured, recoiling and deciding on his next course of action. Down low on the floor, Bob waited, pistol aimed to shoot upward if the murderer made a dash through the doorway. There was no gunfire for more than half a minute, and then a new eruption of staccato bursts, but not aimed toward the room he was in. He heard the doorway to the faculty lounge being shot open, a few shots from within that small room, a pause, then more shots, this time apparently from the classroom across the hall next to the faculty lounge. The bastard was pushing on with his killing, not coming back for him. Bastard! He had faced someone armed, but now retreated to kill in other rooms. Come on, you pig-eater, come on! He screamed, trying to lure him away from his mission. Then there was a sudden change to the sound. A shotgun? Half a dozen explosive shots rang out, children screaming, trapped in the corners of the room across the hall, and dying. God, what do I do? He silently prayed. Hold here. At least I've got this room secure, or try and get the bastard and finish him. If he gets me, these kids die. What do I do? He begged God as the sound of weapons shifted yet again. They were pistol shots, and someone, he recognized the voice of Olivia Wilson, a mild, bespectacled reading teacher, begged for mercy for her kids. Her cries were suddenly cut off. God, do I hold here or try and stop him? The answer finally came from within. Get these kids out, then try and take the killer on again. Get the kids out now, he hissed to Patty, who finally nodded acknowledgement as he pointed to the shattered windows. Cop cars, half a dozen, were racing down the approach road to the school. He could see one of the vehicles being hit by fire, but at least that meant one of the murderer's attention was diverted. Patty, get the kids out now. I can't go after them until you're out of this room. I'll hold the door here while you get them out. Chapter 5 As they had so adroitly planned, so clearly understanding their enemy far better than the enemy understood themselves, the highways were now flooding with traffic. There were over 70 million children attending nearly 100,000 public schools in America. Millions more were in private, church, and parochial schools. The targets had been carefully chosen, 
to hit outside of major cities and in geographical locations so that no part of the country felt safe. All of the targets were very close to interstate highways, the route that so many parents would flock to within minutes to speed to the schools their children were in, whether that school was under attack or not. The fear of school shootings had been a running nightmare in the heart of every parent since Columbine. Endless rounds of arguments and debates swirled around the scenario. It was those lone, sick killers in American schools across the previous two decades that had inspired the Caliph with his plan. Nearly all had been psychotic American males from teens to early twenties. All were loners. Nearly all had fantasized online and obsessively spent hundreds of hours with the endless outpouring of America's entertainment media of shooter games and mass murder movies. Nearly all had played out a sick, perverted fantasy in their final moments as they had become killers, usually vengeance for some slight from a girl, from a bully, or from the system. The killings were a power trip during their final moments that all would cower as they stalked the halls. And nearly all had ultimately proven themselves cowards in the caliph's eyes, either fleeing when the police arrived or killing themselves like Hitler in his bunker. And so the pattern of response in American schools had evolved, a plethora of this campus is a gun-free zone, drills and more drills, usually just with teachers, of course, no one wanted to frighten the children, even though they saw the news every night and chatted about it on Facebook, lock the door, lie down, wait for rescue. A few will die, maybe even a few dozen, but the vast majority will be saved by lying down and waiting for others to come to the rescue. The brilliance of the Caliph's plan was understanding the pattern of the infidel's reaction, how they would respond collectively to a threat to their precious children. They usually had just one or two offspring, not six or eight, with a willingness to see their progeny sacrificed to Allah's will. No, for them each child was precious, doted upon and coddled. The parents across the entire nation would react, the nation falling into mass panic. Unlike the fool Bin Laden's attack on 9-11, every American would feel personally threatened, not just those living in New York and Washington, every American in those first moments would fear that their precious child was about to become a target as well. Though only a few out of nearly 100,000 schools were now threatened, millions of parents would rush out of their homes and their offices and flood onto the interstates. The frenzy would build. The planners had calculated it well and had laughed over it. Thus it now unfolded, and the time to launch Sword Two had come. There was no need to send the final message. All who were trained knew the exact moment, but in his arrogant delight he ordered the message to be sent anyhow. Sword Two. After sending the message, the transmitting phone was left active in the corner of a captured Christian church near Raqqa, the messenger laughing as he drove off. Sword Two had already begun in some places such as Austin, Syracuse, and near Portland, Maine, ahead of schedule. Attack teams began to pull out of hotel parking lots, which— in less than a minute put them on the American interstates, highways built as copies of the German autobahns, ironically ordered as a defense measure in the event of a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. Sword II was made up of teams of two to three jihadist martyrs. There was a driver, armed with a nine-millimeter pistol for a final defense, and one or two gunmen armed with AK-47s, each with thirty or more clips of jacketed rounds. Simply get on the highway, swing alongside cars, preferably those with a number of passengers, and shoot the driver. Tractor trailers were sweet targets. Drive up, send several shots through the door, then speed on, hoping the truck jackknifes. Even better if it is carrying petrol or some hazardous material. The team that roared onto Interstate 40 near Knoxville headed east for the connection to Interstate 81 and hit their jackpot in the first two minutes. A tractor trailer hauling petrol swerved out of control, the holy warrior laughing that he had hit the driver in the head with his first shot. All of the mayhem that ensued was created by a single 762 round fired from a Kalashnikov. That opening move proved how simple the plan was, how effective it was, and it created joyful anticipation of all that they could accomplish in the next few hours. The truck crashed through the flimsy highway barrier into the westbound lanes rolling over, gasoline spilling out, bursting into flames and seconds later exploding. Two more trucks were taken out by the Knoxville attack team in less than a minute, one on each side of the highway, sealing the road off in both directions. 
Two hundred miles further east on I-40, a SWORD-2 unit was now working in cooperation with the SWORD-1 unit that had stormed an elementary school several miles to the west of Hickory. From the highway, they could see that the school was burning and traffic was backed up on the exit ramp. The American parents were in complete panic. Apparently an accident occurred at the top of the ramp blocking the exit. Vehicles were swinging onto the grassy berm to get around the bottleneck, but since it had rained heavily the night before, many were bogging down, wheels spinning. The team of three actually broke their train procedure for the moment, so rich was their target now. Coming to a stop, one of the killers shot the driver of the car behind them and triggered a chain reaction accident involving several dozen cars. The jihadists then exited their vehicle and stood along the side of the road, calling on their god, laughing as they turned the traffic jam at the exit ramp into target practice, one ordering the other to take aimed single shots and not waste ammunition on such easy targets. Several dozen frantic parents were slaughtered in little more than a minute. It was almost too easy, they thought, as they got back into their car and pressed on westward. Nearly all of the other teams stuck to their training in those first minutes, on Interstate 287, the outer ring of New York City, 30 cars were taken off the road in the first five minutes. At a jammed exit ramp near the school under attack in Bakersfield, California, nearly as many parents were now dead as students in the school. In reality, the casualty rate in the schools was just now beginning to soar as captive children were herded into the gym to drag out the agony of what the response team thought would be negotiations. All negotiations were a sham, of course. A knife could kill quietly, even gruesomely, while those surrounding the building outside heard nothing from the locker rooms where the slaughter was taking place and thought they were talking their opponents into laying down their weapons. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Wheeling, West Virginia, Birmingham, Alabama, Little Rock, Arkansas, Crete, Nebraska, Salt Lake City, Utah, Phoenix, Arizona, and along remote stretches of highways such as south of Valdosta, Georgia, and northward along I-77 into West Virginia, the 30-plus teams of Sword 2 were unleashing death. The roads were packed with parents bent on reaching their children, most not even seeing death racing up behind them or about to pass in the opposite direction. Only one team of Sword 2 had been completely stopped in those first minutes, due to a random encounter with a county sheriff in an unmarked car near Kingston, New York. It was one of those one-in-a-million moments, but all plans, even the best-laid ones, are prone to a random factor. The officer had served four tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan with a military police unit. He, like nearly every police officer in America, was racing to secure a community school in the minutes after Sword One was unleashed. As he approached the entry ramp over the interstate, which at this location was part of the New York Turnpike, he saw the attack vehicle with its two gunmen who were heading to the Turnpike to start their attack. A flash of recognition. What drew his attention were the windows of the vehicle. All of them were down, and the day was chilly. He looked closer. Could the man in the passenger seat actually be that particularly troublesome bastard from the prison near Baghdad, one who had taunted him back in 2009 when the administration decided to release thousands of such prisoners that they would meet again in America. There was a brief instant of eye contact, and the way the man reacted caught him now as well. Even innocent folks would do a bit of a double-take if they suddenly realized that a police officer was staring at them. But guilty of something? They would either try to brazen it out by staring back with an I ain't done nothing wrong so why in hell are you looking at me look, or a quick furtive turning away of the eyes, acting as if they had not seen him, but then catching occasional sidelong glances to see if he was still studying them. This one started the nervous sidelong glances, then turned to say something to the driver of the car looking back over his shoulder as their car sped down the entry ramp. They were wearing black, and it looked as if they were shoulder straps for vests, the type of vests used for combat gear. Procedure as a county sheriff was to call the turnpike police, but to hell with procedure on this day, he swung his vehicle about and raced onto the turnpike in pursuit. They were already speeding up. Only months earlier, sitting up at two in the morning, he had watched the video released by ISIS showing them blowing cars off a major highway while music in praise of their god played. It was expert video, filmed with GoPro cameras, with laughter and taunts as background noise as they machine-gunned carloads of refugees. And now the slaughter was about to happen here. 
It was confirmed by puffs of smoke, followed by a car that they were passing swerving off the highway, fragments of broken glass spilling across the road. He radioed in the report, what he was going to do, and without throwing on his lights, he accelerated quickly, ramming the back of the attacker's car. He eased back on the gas for several seconds. His car was loaded with a lot more horsepower than the jihadists, and then swung to their left. The gunman leaned out the open window to shoot him, but the former MP knew his game, ducking low as a couple of shots shattered his windshield. He floored the gas pedal, advanced to near parallel with the killers, cut hard across and rammed the side of their car. The two vehicles spun out of control. The three jihadists and the sheriff were dead a few seconds later. It was the only complete failure for ISIS in the opening minutes of Sword Two. Near Portland, Maine. The incessant ringing of her cell phone finally jarred Kathy Peterson out of her hysteria. She had been leaning on the horn of her car for several minutes, cursing the driver in front of her for blocking the entry ramp to the interstate. The overpass to the entry ramp was packed with stalled traffic. The phone call was again from her friend Mary Browning. She ignored it, looking up to realize that the driver she had been swearing at was out of his car, walking back to her. Instinctively, she reached for the pistol tucked into her jeans pocket. Was he one of them? She held the pistol up, and the man slowed, raising his hands, actually appearing to smile nervously as he stepped backward several feet, then slowly motioned for her to roll her window down. Hey, look, lady, don't blame me. The road ahead is blocked. Can you back up so I can get out of this jam? He again motioned for her to lower her pistol, which she did, then pointed forward, repeating his appeal. He was right. Cars were backed up across the entire approach to the interstate. A state police car, just out of sight until now, blocked the road, lights flashing. I have to get to my daughter and husband's school, she cried. Which one? Chamberlain Middle. That's where I'm heading to. Can you back up? She got out and looked to the vehicle behind her, the driver staring at her and shouting for her to move. Kathy went to try and talk to her, but the woman refused to roll her window down, screaming at her to move it. It was gridlock, and then she heard it, sirens approaching fast from the southbound side. They rocketed under the overpass bridge that she was standing on, one of them skidding to a stop while the other pressed on, banking his car across two lanes to block traffic. Someone pointed to a plume of smoke that suddenly ignited a mile or so away, screaming that it was the school on fire. She knew the school was more to the right, on the south side of the highway, not the north side, but the hysteria took hold. Whatever was burning was on the highway. Sirens again. The state trooper who had stopped down on the highway was out of his vehicle, carrying a rifle, bracing it across the hood of his car. Southbound, cars were moving fast, driven as if every driver were drunk, Flashing blue lights became visible, and a dark blue sedan appeared, swerving across two lanes, moving to pass a green SUV. A crackle of gunshots sounded, and the side window of the SUV shattered. The car swerving into a sideways skid, the blue sedan racing past it at over ninety miles an hour. The cop down on the highway opened fire, tracking the sedan, but his half-dozen shots apparently had no effect. There was only gunfire flashing from the sedan's rear passenger window in reply. Those around Kathy ran to the other side of the overpass, shouting that the sedan was getting away, screaming impotent curses at it while down on the interstate, the trooper who had stopped was back into his car, driving through a cut across into the southbound side, joining in the procession of a dozen police cars still in pursuit. The shot-up SUV was on its side, crashed into the grassy berm. No one was stopping to help, if help was possible. You still for Chamberlain Middle, lady? She looked back at the middle-aged man, dressed in typical Mainer business, a blue blazer and shirt with no tie, chinos, and boat shoes. Yes, my son is a student there, seventh grade. Let's see if we can get around this on back roads. She got back into her car and tried to back up, but there was less than a foot to spare. She backed up as far as she could until bumpers hit. It gave the man in front of her just enough room to start squeezing his small fiat back and forth before breaking free of the gridlock, turning about to head in the opposite direction. He actually drove with two wheels up on the walkway as he squeezed between two stalled SUVs similar to hers. She sat in her car, not sure whether to wish him good luck or curse him for the way he was taking off, but he stopped, rolled down his window, and motioned for her to get in. Without a second thought, she abandoned her car, leaving the keys in the ignition so someone could move it if the road was ever cleared. She ran to the passenger side of her benefactor's car and squeezed in. Never thought I'd like this car. 
Wife insisted we buy it to save on gas, he offered as she buckled herself into the narrow seat. If it gets us through this, I'll buy one. I'm Craig Sullivan. My boy John is at Chamberlain. Kathy Peterson, my daughter Wendy, is in seventh grade. My husband Bob teaches there. We've got to get there now. I know Bob. My son thinks the world of him. There was a moment of silence as he squeezed around a stalled dump truck. Could you switch on my pad so we can check the reporting from the school? She had forgotten to bring hers as she had rushed out the door and was glad to have the link. She picked up his pad from the floor, switched it on, and found the website of a local news station. To repeat the latest news, the governor of Maine has just announced that all schools in the state are in lockdown mode. He has appealed to parents to not approach any school to try and retrieve their children at this time. I am asked to repeat that. Parents are not to try and go to any school within the state. All schools are in lockdown. No one in, no one out. The governor stated that law enforcement have been scrambled to every school, public and private, throughout the state, and the children within are secured and safe. No child is to be released until it is felt that the situation is firmly under control. We have several reports now, one from Sanford, Maine, others from outside the state, of parents being mistaken for terrorists and shot. The situation, needless to say, is tense. If you are going to your child's school, please stop and go home. Your presence can do nothing to help protect your child and might actually hinder our law enforcement and emergency personnel. She lowered the volume and looked in inquiry over at Craig. Screw that, he snapped. Chamberlain is in the middle of this and under attack. I told my son that if the crap ever hit the fan, he was to get out of the school and to hell with what any teacher or administrator said. He looked at her, realizing as he spoke that her husband was one of said teachers and that his comment might provoke an angry retort. She nodded her head. Agreed. We go to the school, and she turned the volume up to monitor the news while Craig pressed in the direction of the school. The rapidly escalating national panic was fueled even more when one overexcited, self-aggrandizing reporter, who had nearly created a debacle in New Orleans during Katrina when he hysterically reported a total descent into anarchy in the emergency shelter established in the Superdome, was now crying that he believed that the attacks were spreading to dozens of schools and that thousands of children were being slaughtered across the nation. His pronouncement quickly morphed into a report of fact as it leapt to the social internet sites, causing millions more to give way to their fears and ignore the logical warnings of state governors. There was a time when a public official might actually have been trusted, such as the voice of Franklin Delano Roosevelt the day after December 7th, and again Rudy Giuliani in the hours after the World Trade Center had been hit. But whom was actually trusted now? Who was trusted when every day yet a new scandal was revealed? Even before the killing started on this day, public trust in public officials was at its lowest in the history of the Republic. Easy enough for a governor to say stay at home was the first response of millions. His kids are in private school with 24-7 armed security around them. Members of Congress on up to the president? Their kids were in the most expensive Quaker school in the country in an upscale neighborhood of D.C. Few commented how ironic it was that a religion devoted to complete non-violence, even in the face of this kind of attack, was the most heavily armed and secured school campus in the country, with security posted there round the clock, even in the middle of the night. Any attacker would face a firestorm of steel, complete with helicopter support, within seconds. Who are they to tell us to stay home when our children are dying and theirs are protected? And so the roads continued to fill up. To add to the irony of it all, the news feeds switched to Washington, D.C., with a long-distance shot of a helicopter landing on the front lawn of that upscale school in Washington, a flurry of movement around it, heavily armed security forming a perimeter, a reporter announcing that the children of the president were thankfully safe and being airlifted to an undisclosed location. Kelly watched the brief clip, incredulous at the insensitivity of it all. Never ever would she wish harm upon that man's innocent children, but it was an aloof display of the arrogance of power, as if she was to feel relieved that at least his children were well protected, while at this very moment her daughter could be wounded or dead, her husband wounded or dead. Neither had a swarm of secret service agents, marine-piloted helicopters, and, undoubtedly at this moment, attack helicopters and fighters circling over Chamberlain Middle School. She was jolted out of her resentful thoughts as Craig slammed on the brakes and turned the wheel. 
They were driving through a residential neighborhood, flanking the interstate, where traffic was at a complete standstill. The smoke plume they had seen in the distance was now visible, a multi-vehicle pileup on the roadway. Directly in front of them, a pickup truck had run a stop sign, not even slowing, skidded to make the turn, fishtailing, and slammed into a car headed the other way. Craig dodged the wreck, adroitly hitting the gas to regain control, and narrowly missed a man running down the middle of the street in the direction of the school. Then he sped up again. She looked back at the pad. Back to our network headquarters in New York. There was a pause for what seemed like an eternity. The network had already created a logo, America Under Attack. The logo snapped off, replaced by the familiar comforting anchor for the network's mid-afternoon programming. It was obvious, though, that he was struggling for the composure to convey calm, particularly after the hysterical report of one of their reporters minutes earlier claimed that attacks against schools were spreading across the nation. He identified himself, then pressed straight in. We have... Received reports from affiliates across the nation that numerous schools are under some form of attack. However, I can state clearly that only five of these have been confirmed and identified as ongoing attacks. Contrary to some reports from this network, it was obvious he was furious over the hysterical report of minutes earlier claiming mass attacks across the country. The names of the schools which we have confirmed are under attack are listed at the bottom of your screen. Even if your child is in one of those schools, government officials implore you not to go there until the situation is under control. If your child's school is not on this list, please remain at home and off the highways. Kathy felt hesitation and looked over at Craig, his jawline set as he swerved around a three-car accident at the next intersection. We're going, he confirmed, and she nodded, saying nothing. A new dimension to this day is now unfolding. Reports are starting to come in that while police attention across the nation has been focused on securing our schools, attacks have spread to our interstate highway system. So far, over two dozen affiliates are reporting drive-by shootings on interstate highways. There is no discernible pattern to the locations of these attacks. Many of these attacks are taking place hundreds of miles away from any of the schools that we know are under siege. The nature of the highway attacks is identical to reports we broadcasted back in the spring when the terrorist army of ISIS moved into northern Iraq. As he spoke, a box taking up half of the screen flashed on, time-stamped from early June and filmed from the interior of a car of barrels of AK-47s stuck out of side windows and Middle Eastern music playing. The murderers were shouting and laughing as they drove up alongside an orange car, and then a hail of gunfire poured into it. The car swerved off the road, accompanied by laughter and shouts of glee and cries of Allahu Akbar, as the orange car, riddled with bullet holes, crashed. We have footage of such attacks from our affiliate in Austin, Texas, and from Knoxville, Tennessee, taken by news helicopters. The box showing the first attack was replaced by two smaller ones, video shot from helicopters, showing a massive conflagration on Interstate 40 filmed just east of Knoxville, Tennessee, engulfing both sides of the highway, dozens of cars piled up. The second small screen footage was of a vehicle pursued by four or five police cars passing a white sedan, gunfire striking the sedan which then swerved and slammed into the pillar of an overpass. The screen returned to full size. Even as I am speaking to you, my producer is telling me that more footage is coming in from Daytona, Florida, and Dover, Delaware, of similar attacks. He paused, and it was obvious he was not acting for dramatic effect. His voice was trembling, near to breaking. In light of what we are now seeing, I must personally say that America is facing a coordinated attack by a foreign enemy. There is no hard evidence yet, but I will lay my career on the line with this that we are facing the long-anticipated and publicly announced attack that ISIS has been threatening us with for months. It is either ISIS or a radical group associated with them. This horrific attack bears the markings of mass murderers without regard for any concept of civilized behavior. I therefore appeal to all of you to do two things. First, pray to God that this scourge shall speedily pass away. That shocked Kathy. His words were both Lincoln-esque, but also unheard of in this current age. A reporter asking his listeners to appeal to God? 
an ironic thought that even now, within minutes, the network would probably be flooded with text messages and phone calls demanding that the reporter be fired for jamming his religious views down the throats of his audience and that he make an on-air apology for it. And second, I appeal to you that if you are on the road trying to reach your children in schools, please pull over, stop, and take a deep breath. He paused, obviously welling up. I cannot leave here to try to reach my kids, though every fiber of my being as a father is screaming at me to do so. He paused, lowering his head for a moment. In television, even a few seconds of silence felt like an eternity, and it was a good ten seconds before he regained his composure to face the camera again. We need to take a break, was all he could now muster. Kathy looked at Craig, for a moment filled with doubt about what they were doing. We aren't going any further, he announced. She wondered if he was indeed abandoning their quest and was ready to turn about. If so, she would tell him to stop, get out, and run the rest of the way. Their school, her daughter's school, her husband's school, was confirmed as being under attack. It was not a rumor, it was not a fear, it was confirmed, and she had to be there. Craig skidded to a stop, and she looked up again. It was not that he was giving up. They were still a quarter mile out from Chamberlain Middle, but the road ahead was jammed, bumper to bumper, red taillights glowing, frantic parents getting out of their cars, abandoning them in the traffic jam, deciding to run toward the chaos. Ambulances and police cars were driving across lawns and walkways, sirens wailing. It was a cacophony of madness. She got out of the car, a bit startled when Craig actually grabbed her shoulder. Come on! he cried, and she started to run with him. She felt as if her heart were about to burst, for in the distance she could hear the repetitive bursts of gunfire. Her husband, her daughter, were in the deepest circle of hell. Inside Joshua Chamberlain Middle School, the gunfire ceased in the room across the hall. Bob could hear muffled, child-voiced moans and cries. Heartbreaking. So many calls for Mommy as they died. Mommy who, when they were at the arrogant age of twelve and thirteen, was a source of embarrassment and eye-rolling when an attempt was made to kiss and hug them in public. But in a moment of terror, of pain, of dying, it was a cry to a mother for comfort, to hold them and to ease the pain as they died, and it steeled Bob for what he had to do. He was so shocked by the anguish of it all that he first had to wipe tears from his eyes, silently cursing himself for his moment of frozen inaction and fear. How could any man, any human being, inflict such suffering upon children? He could hear the triumphal calls to their Allah echoing down the hallway, and it filled him with rage, and now the motivation to move aggressively and fight back. All the years of political correctness— all the appeals from the nation's leaders to extend a hand of friendship to all, if really true, where was the righteous anger now? In the same way Christians by the tens of thousands rose up in anger against the evils of the Westboro Church that harassed the families of dead soldiers returning home in caskets from the Middle East and taunted gays and anyone who was different, he had enough of an interest in history to recall, even in these few seconds, Winston Churchill's sarcastic response and warnings against the appeasement of his nation's leader in 1938, and the terrible price it would eventually cost Great Britain and the free world. And that price had now come due again, literally in the corridors of his school, his daughter's school, and he was at the very tip of the spear of that price. And now he prayed that in the next few seconds he could do something anything to slow them down, to buy time, and if need be, to die. To die well, doing what was right. He checked on Patty, who was guiding her charges up and out of the shattered window, encouraging each to run the moment they hit the ground. To his horror, he saw two of them drop, caught in the gunfire raging outside the building, but the others were making it through. It did not take a trained expert to know that a moving target was infinitely harder to hit than one cowering in a corner or lying prone on the floor. If some of them were getting through, it was better than waiting here for certain death. Patty's gaze caught his eye as she helped the last child up to the window before climbing out herself. She was crying, staring straight at him. God be with you, Bob, she mouthed the words, 
nearly silent, then turned to drop out the window behind the last of her children. There were six more classrooms down the long hall beyond the one he was holed up in, plus the room across the hallway where the murderer was finishing off the last of his victims. He prayed that the teachers in those rooms had followed Patty's lead, but knew they had not. One was Margaret Redding's classroom. Last he had seen her, she was cowering in the faculty lounge, her teaching assistant left in charge of the classroom. That poor, harried elderly woman was afraid of her own shadow and would follow every order by Margaret, which would include ordering the children to lie down as sheep and await slaughter. He saw no other children sprinting across the playground. There was no view to the other side of the building, but he had to assume that far too many classrooms still had victims waiting for their executioner, who would call out to his alleged god as he put a nine-millimeter bullet into the head of each child before moving on to the next room. He could hear the sirens outside, the thumping of at least one helicopter which he hoped would bring succor. He did not know that it was a news helicopter filming and transmitting the insanity rather than a SWAT team, which, in reality, was still forming up in downtown Portland and not yet in the air. The shooting and screams in the room across the hallway stopped. The fire alarm was still wailing its incessant numbing shriek, sprinklers continuing to douse the corridor. He was down flat on the floor at the doorway, pistol raised, aimed at the open doorway across the hall. He kept going over in his head the training he had received for the concealed permit. Breathe in, half exhale, aim and squeeze. Breathe in, half exhale. But he did not still the hyperventilation of fear and nervousness. Three bullets. I've got three bullets. He has hundreds. Breathe, half exhale. Hail Mary, full of grace. He started to pray, though it had been years since he last attended Mass on the day he and Kathy married. A tall, dark shadow appeared in the doorway across the hall. Now, he squeezed off two rounds, aimed straight at the chest, the center of the body. The shadow staggered backwards for a moment, but then just came forward toward the doorway where Bob was waiting. A flash moment of terror. What in hell was this, the Terminator, indestructible? The murderer's weapon lowered, aimed straight at him. He saw the muzzle flash. A terrible shock struck him in the back. His lower body went numb. Armor. He has body armor. Bob was in that instant inwardly amazed that he could recognize such a thing as he looked up, saw his opponent drawing closer, weapon at the shoulder, aiming down to deliver a killing shot to his head, before moving on to murder more children. Bob pointed his pistol straight up and squeezed off the last round, his bullet striking his foe just below the left eye, killing him instantly, so that the jihadist staggered backwards and collapsed into the room where he had been so gleefully slaughtering the defenseless but seconds earlier. Bob laid in shock for long seconds, empty pistol aimed at the recumbent body across the school corridor, the legs of his enemy twitching spasmodically for several seconds before going still. He kept the pistol aimed at him, not yet registering that the slide of his pistol was fully back, indicating his weapon was empty. When he did realize it, there was a brief thought to look about on the floor for the single unfired cartridge he had ejected earlier. The floor around him was slick with blood. It was not registering yet that it was his own blood, commingled with the blood of his enemy from his first shot to the jaw. There was silence in the building except for the wailing cry of the fire alarm. Was there any way to turn that damn thing off? he wondered. Sprinklers in the hallway were still spraying out a mist of water, diluting the rivulets of blood seeping out of the scores of children, the principal and the two teachers lying dead in the corridor. More firing, thundering loud from down by the administrative area, he dared to peek out from the cover of the doorway. No jihadist was in sight, but there was someone firing from that area, while from outside the building he heard sirens and what sounded like more gunfire. A shadow, a dark face covered with a ski mask, appeared at the end of the hallway, shouting something that he assumed was Arabic. A query, an order, another call. A sparkle-like effect appeared on the wall above him, Bullets fired from outside were impacting above the killer. The face disappeared, and a couple of seconds later there was a sustained burst of automatic fire in reply. Bob continued to look down the corridor. Was that the pathetic-looking body of Mr. Carl in the middle of the hallway, 
blank eyes staring at him with warning, reproach, or orders to keep going, to keep fighting back. He had seen three killers storming his building, three against five hundred and thirty children and thirty-seven adults. He had without doubt dropped one of the killers, but that meant the two remained. Chechnya. This was not some random act of madness. This was a well-planned attack by jihadists. Their mission was to kill as many defenseless innocents as possible before they themselves were taken to paradise. They were remorseless murderers. There would be no negotiating. For negotiating simply bought time to inflict more killing. He recalled a discussion on a news channel, a commentator who was bitterly denounced by various friendship with Islam organizations afterwards, quoting their Quran, that ultimately negotiations with infidels were simply a ploy until true believers gained control and then the infidels were to submit or die. All bargaining was a sham, for each bargain would be a step backwards. The only way he could bargain now was to somehow get a weapon and continue to fight back. Two killers still at large in his school, and he had an empty gun. A complete sense of impotence overwhelmed him for a moment. At least his daughter's class had gotten out. Wendy? He did not even know if she had made it through the kill zone or not, and the thought of that filled him with rage. Bastards! Damn cowardly bastards! Target us, the adults in the Trade Center and the Pentagon, but this was a step beneath the gutter of all humanity. They had brought their hell to Chamberlain Middle School near Portland, Maine. Chamberlain. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. How few knew that their school was actually named after a hero of the Civil War, a holder of the Medal of Honor for his gallantry and leadership at Gettysburg. There was supposed to be a ritual each year to honor his memory, but Few paid attention when it was held, and many grumbled that it took time out from the pressing need to prepare the students for the next battery of mandatory testing. Taking time to honor some dead guy of a hundred and fifty years ago, there were other things far more important. He had a memory of reading about Chamberlain, how when his regiment was out of ammunition, facing five times their number charging up the hill that they were ordered to hold at all costs, he had come to what was the only logical conclusion— he had ordered his men to fix bayonets and charge. The terrifying reality that the shot put into his back had paralyzed him was beginning to sink in. Charging was out, but less than twenty feet away there was at least one gun and plenty of ammunition. He could still block this corridor against the other murderers for a few more precious minutes until help arrived. He started to drag his body across the water and blood-soaked hallway, and then the pain hit agonizing, terrifying. He could see Mr. Carl, his sightless eyes staring at him, in spite of the shrieking of the fire alarm, the spray of water cascading down, he could hear the gunfire, the sound of hot shell casings ejecting onto the checkerboard flooring by the foyer, and more distant firing coming from the other wing of the school. With his gaze fixed down the corridor, he continued to crawl, foot by agonizing foot, toward the man he had just killed, who still held in his blood-stained hands the means to salvation, for at least a few more minutes. A distant shadowed face appeared again at the end of the corridor, staring straight at him. To Bob, his eyes looked to be the eyes of Satan incarnate on earth, remorseless and cold as a serpent's. The killer aimed his weapon.